Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray Beach's regular commission meeting scheduled for Tuesday, July 6, 2021 at 4 p.m. Please call the roll. Mr. Frankel. Present. Ms. Cassell. Here. Ms. Johnson. Present. Mayor Petrolia. Here. If we could all stand for the pledge. Okay, so moving on to the agenda approval, if there's any changes? I, I would like to make one addition. I thought we had it on here, and if not, um, if there's a reason why, then let me know. Um, just having discussion about uh, Surfside, the issues that uh, we can and cannot address um, when we were talking in the uh, agenda meeting, I thought we were gonna have that on this one. Um, Madam Mayor, we could add that either by motion to the agenda or we could have that at the end during the comment section. That's what, um, that was my intent. Yeah, the problem Whatever with the, the comments the is that nobody else knows that we're gonna be talking about it and that's the reason why I was hoping to see it on as an agended item. So if we wanna discuss it or if we wanna push it off, I, I would leave it up to the commission to make that decision um, so that it would be noticed or if we wanna go ahead and discuss it, we can do that. Whatever the, you, it. You know, anybody would like to. I'll make a motion. To add it. To add it to okay. the agenda. Second. Okay, very good. So um, let's call the roll then, I guess. Well, I want to. Oh, I'm sorry. There's more. Yep. Um, if I could discuss or pull 6G. 6G? Mm -hmm. Hold on just a sec. Okay, so that's resolution 106-21, Renourishment of the Beach. Yes. And you wanna bring that over to the regular agenda? Yes, please. All right, so we'll make that 7BB, and I was gonna do 7AA then as the discussion. 7AA would be the discussion on um, uh, Surfside. I'd like to have a discussion on 6I. And let's see. That's another I? one, but I can't see. Right. That is the Baxter Woodson or Woodman. Right. All right, seven CC if everybody is good with that. Anything else? Any other changes? That's it. Madam Mayor, I do have two changes. Sure. Please. Um, we'd like to request withdrawal of item seven A. Okay. Um, that applicant, the owner, actually sold the property. So that would be just a permanent withdrawal of the item. Okay, and this is Okay, got it. And the second request would be to defer item 6F to the first meeting of August, please. Okay, and 6F is? That is the interlocal agreement with the okay. city of Boynton. Yep. And deferred it until when? To the next meeting. To the first August, meeting the first in meeting in August, in August please. In August. Okay. That's not gonna interfere with um, the requirement, is it? No, uh, we actually are making the request in order to allow Boynton Beach Commission to approve the ILA first. Okay, and then just one other addition. We have uh, a, a special guest here today, drove all the way from, um, from our, uh, from, I'm sorry, from not Atlanta, it's College Park right. with his two sons. This is our future city manager, and he's gonna step up and during the presentations um, make some comments. So I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware that we were gonna be doing that as well. So if that's all the changes, then we have a, first, uh, uh, we have a motion and a second, and we can call the roll. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Very good. So at this point in time, I'd like to invite um, our future city manager, Mr. Terrence Moore, up to the podium. If you'd like to make some comments, you're welcome to do so now. We'll start out with you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Mayor Petrolia, Vice Mayor Johnson, Deputy Vice Mayor Frankel, Commissioner Cassell, Interim City Manager Alvarez, City Attorney Lynn Gellin, Madam City Clerk, staff, thank you all very much for having me, and ladies and gentlemen in attendance, so thank you all very much for your being here, your, hospitali your hospitality, your warmth, and quite frankly, since the selection process was completed June 8th, subsequently with the contract authorization June 10th, 
I've had a number of people in Delray Beach reaching out to me, not only throughout Delray Beach, but throughout South Florida as a whole. Because as many of you might recall, I do have a background in South Florida, having been an assistant city manager in Deerfield Beach, Florida, back when I was a kid. And so a number of people have actually contacted me to welcome me home, so to speak, because of the opportunity to join the fabulous city of Delray Beach, Florida. So I like to share with everyone publicly, and I did discuss this with the commissioners via email communication this past Friday, the primary purpose of my being here is to not only finalize pre-employment particulars with the Department of Human Resources and Risk Management and that, but the fact that we were able to get matters taken care of in terms of pre-employment, screening, health care, all those associated details, in addition to my being in position to secure a permanent residence here in the corporate limits of Delray Beach, Florida. So I've been working with people who've been very helpful in that regard, and I offer my thanks respectively. And therefore, I'm very happy, excited, and enthusiastic to work closely with the elected officials, the community stakeholders, residents to help lead Delray Beach into a very bright, tremendous future, well regarded. So for that reason, ladies and gentlemen, I thought I'd take a couple minutes to offer a few words to that effect. But I also have, as you've mentioned in your introductory comments, Madam Mayor, my two sons are with me here. So first of all, Please forgive me if I come off as if I'm a 1960s television show game, host, game show host <laughs> as I introduce them, but they are my family. My, my two sons are my family, and I thought it would be fitting for them to be introduced accordingly because not only will I serve as your city manager, but as a resident of Delray Beach and likewise a principal stakeholder. First of all, my oldest son, Parker Moore, if I can ask you to stand, Mr. Parker Moore. <laughs> game show host. So Parker Moore, <laughs> Parker Moore is a rising sophomore at Texas A&M University. He had an excellent first year having made Dean's List Honor Roll, for crying out loud. So I'm very proud of that. Yeah. Well spent. Good investment. Make it count. We have to keep him moving forward in that regard. And his little brother, Grant Moore. Grant Moore. Master Grant Moore. He's actually a student at Eaton High School, varsity football center. And he's actually a very personable, charismatic intellect, if you will. Parker's a lot more structured, a little bit more formal, a lot like his father. <laughs> so both good guys, really enjoy having them. I'm really blessed that the two of them are my sons, and we do a good job in that regard. So you look, you'll be able to interact with them, see them around, particularly during the winter breaks, spring breaks, throughout the summer, et cetera. And it was really interesting, ladies and gentlemen, because as I was making arrangements for Grant to be with me before starting service in Delray Beach, speaking to his mom about that, their mom about that, June 10th, it was the evening after you all ratified the contract for by coming on board to service your next city manager. So speaking to mom about making arrangements for Grant to come, you know, Grant's still in high school, spend time with dad, the summer, and that whole bit. And so mom says, her name is June. She says, well, you know, Terrence, Parker would like to come with, be with you for that experience as well, because part of the exercise was to give them the opportunity to have a road trip from College Park, Atlanta, down here to Delray Beach so that we can house shop, give them an opportunity to offer their input. But of course, with limited offerings in that, I think it will be a pretty straightforward decision. <laughs> so June says to me, well, Terrence, you know, Parker would like to be a part of it. And I'm thinking, well, Parker, you know, he's 19. He has his girlfriend. He has his summer job, Texas A&M, Dean Sliss, on a row. He's got his life. But he's not going to want to come. Five minutes later, I get a call from Parker on the cell phone. Five minutes after hanging up with mom, Parker gives me a call. Dad, I want to go. I'd like to be a part of it. And I, my first thought, being as formal and structured as I am, well, Parker, you have your work commitments until you have to head back to College Station for school between now and August. Well, Dad, I think I can get the week off of July 5th. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very excited, very enthusiastic. And he's pretty calm and structured. So it's rare for him to express enthusiasm, especially when talking to the likes of me. <laughs> so in any event, I said, well, talk with your supervisor, make sure you can get the days off, and I will make arrangements for travel to accommodate that schedule. And sure enough, the following day, Friday, June 11th, Dad, I was able to speak with 
My supervisor explained to him about the situation regarding my father, Delray Beach, Florida, new city manager, got to spend time with him for a few days, and thus they were able to give him the time off. So Parker here, off from July 5th through July 9th, therefore we decided to spend time here in Delray Beach for the purposes intended the 6th, 7th, and 8th. So with that, Parker, publicly, I've stated this to you privately. I'm glad you're here. That was actually very dear and special to me. So I share that sentiment with everybody here. He made this a priority, levels and gentlemen. <laughs> Girlfriend, Texas A&M, part-time summer job. He made this a priority. He made this a commitment. So I'm really thankful and appreciative to that effect. I've said it to you personally. I'll say so in front of everybody in this room. So thank you very much. Grant, you didn't have a lot of choice. <laughs> You always have a lot of fun no matter where you go. You're that personable type of guy. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, Madam Mayor, Commissioners, I really appreciate the opportunity to say a few words, introduce you all to my family. Looking forward to August 2nd, actually a little bit before that, as I wrap up my home search hopefully over the next couple of days. So thank you again very much. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for your attendance and the youth participants in that. Congratulations to you all and thank you for your all's commitment to defining you all's prospective future and giving Delray Beach the opportunity to be a part of it. Excellent work. Thank, Thank you all. You. So nice. So nice. Go right ahead. Dad, Dad, I'd just like to tell you, it's the beach. It's the beach. Oh, of course. By all means. It's the beach. I have to keep that in mind as well. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? No, thank you for coming. Thank you all. Good to see you. All right, and we'll see you all soon, and thanks again. And Jennifer will be in touch as well. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great meeting and take care. Thanks. So glad that you took Thank the you trip all. down. Thank you. All right, very good. So moving on to our um, presentations as per the agenda, we have 4A being um, uh, Anthony Bernson. Um, and this is going to be Lachey. Yes. Hello. Hi. Mary Commission. Well, finally oh, you have an act that you've got to follow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But I don't mind because I love this. I love doing this. And I'm so excited to be here looking at you guys because guess what? I have the most awesome job in the city. And if that is just one thing, that is to produce and introduce to you our employee of the month, Mr. Anthony Burson. Come on. Yay. I'm excited for him because he deserves it, but he also has his director, who will, Miss Kateri Johnson, who will tell you what he did to deserve this awesome achievement. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Commissioners. Um, that true, all of this is truly a hard act to follow, so <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, Anthony has been uh, nominated several times, but this time um, came from the city attorney's office. And um, just basically, I'd like to say it truly is a pleasure to have Anthony working with us. And just to give you a little bit of the background, Anthony came to the city of Delray Beach right during the heart of COVID-19. Um, last year when City Hall was closed, the clerk's office, the entire clerk's office was working remotely. And um, we're so thankful that we did not lose him during this period of time. Um, he, after he received his acceptance letter, it was probably about four weeks, if not longer, before we could actually get him to come and start. And he so diligently reached out to us each and every week. <laughs> and um, he contacted HR all the time, inquiring about his status, when he could start. So we truly appreciate that, that he um, stayed interested. And to this date, that's truly how Anthony operates today. If anyone has had the opportunity to work with him, they can tell you how diligent he is in following up, whether it's with contracts and agreements, advertising notices, paying invoices, just any assignment that I give him. He is so thorough and he follows through and accomplishes the tasks very well. And he does it with such patience and kindness. And I can't ask for 
any more than that. <laughs> he is truly a pleasure to work with, and we in the clerk's office are so very thankful for him, and we appreciate him so very much. So. Fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> Would you like to say a few words? Good afternoon, commissioners, and I really want to thank you all for all of the kind words and um, being able to work with such kind and diligent uh, departmental staff. And they've also helped me during the year that I've been here. So I'm truly appreciative of that as well. So I just want to say thank you for this um, opportunity and also for the recognition that I've been given. Thank you. So Anthony, because you are so amazing and we appreciate you so much, we are going to present on behalf of Mayor and the Commission this awesome plaque. Isn't that beautiful? And guess what else? You get eight hours off with pay. Ah. Woo. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So true. Well, I have to say, Anthony, um, it has been a pleasure um, having you uh, work for the city. Um, I am somebody that gets to have a lot of direct contact with you, and I have to tell you, you've been nothing but professional and pleasant, and it's been an, a, a, a great experience. And thank you so much for choosing Delray Beach as your um, employment, uh, where you've decided to become employed. We, we are so thrilled to have you here. Thank you. Deserved. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Moving on to the um, next generation initiatives. This is a proclamation. Yes. Yeah, the presentation. So, do we? How do you want me to do this? We have the proclamation. You want me to read it into the record? You can, if okay. you like, and it is there. No, I have it right okay. here. Okay. Just didn't know if there was going to be a presentation first. There is going to be a presentation. Are you going to be doing that first? Oh, I thought you wanted it after, but I can do it first, whatever you like. You do what you want. Okay. I'll go, um, you go first, ma'am. You want me to go ahead and read yes, it? Please. Okay, very good. Whereas the City of Delray Beach Internship Program and Next Generation Initiatives offer students the opportunity to learn firsthand how local governments operate. And whereas the City of Delray Beach recognizes the importance of increasing students' knowledge of city operations and the importance of community engagement. And whereas it is the conviction of the City of Delray Beach that the active participation of the students in municipal government will increase their knowledge of civic affairs and offer opportunities for future employment. And whereas the city is focused on developing its talent pipeline through our next generation initiatives. And whereas this participation will strengthen and preserve the right of self-government guaranteed by, uh, by, to us by the U.S. Uh, Constitution. Now, therefore, I, Shelley Petrolia, Mayor of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, on behalf of the City Commission, do here pro hereby proclaim July 6, 2021 as Next Generation Initiatives Day in the city of Delray Beach, Florida and urge all students, schools, businesses and community organizations to join with me in recognizing the value and the need for development, uh, developing and talent pipeline in the city of Delray Beach. The city of Delray Beach encourages students to pursue our shadow day internship and apprenticeship programs where students will have the opportunity to develop a variety of skills and experience necessary that are experience skills and experience necessary in today's global market and economy in witness thereof i have here here unto signed my hand and caused the official seal of the city of delray beach florida to be affixed to this sixth day of july 2021 thank you thank you so you're you're <laughs> up so good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Commissioners, Delray Beach uh, team, uh, community members. Um, my name is Sandra Cordova, and the Assistant HR Generalist here at the City of Delray Beach. Uh, today, I will be presenting on the Next Generation Initiative, as Ms. Petrolia said. So let's begin. So the City of Delray Beach believes that the innovative cities grow when they develop and mentor the next generation of government leaders. 
Therefore, the city is committed to collaborating with colleges, universities, to help cultivate tomorrow's government leaders through our next generation initiatives of Grow Your Own. Some of these programs that start with the Next Generation Initiative include our Delray Shadow Day, our internship programs, our technical apprenticeship programs, which is coming soon, and volunteering. So Delray Shadow Day is a day where college students or recent graduates come in and they are teamed up with different City of Delray Beach employees. The students are paired off based with the employee's um, occupation and their major. We try to link it as close as possible so it's relatable to them. Um, the shadowing experience allows students to observe a full-time professional um, and, uh, during a work day. And since we started this program in December 2017, we've hosted about 140 Delray uh, shadows. So I think that's pretty cool. So next we have our internship program. So City of Delray Beach hosts two different types of internship programs. The first program is our year-long internship, and then we have our summer internship, which is a 10-week program. So the hours depend on the department's needs or the academic credit requirements that the, school, the schools provide to us. And interns work alongside their mentors and work on various projects. And during the summer internship program, Human Resources, with the help of different City of Delray Beach employees, we host different um, career building workshops and networking events. And so here are a couple of images of the different events that we have. So you have Shadow Day, our networking, our farewell um, a luncheon, and during the farewell luncheon, we invite the interns, their mentors, we present them with a certificate of completion. And um, some summer interns, if they would love to present their summer projects, they may, some of the mentors kind of give them their farewell, just to kind of thank them for their time and the, um, what they've given to the city of Dari Beach. Then we have our apprenticeship program. Again, we're really trying to kickstart this program to happen. Um, so we'll only focus on students training for technical positions. We're gonna collaborate with technical schools and try to mentor the next generation of city leaders. And then we have a volunteer. So if students wanna give back to the community, this is a great chance for them to do so and kind of help them with that. And then here is one of my favorite things. This is our uh, Next Generation Initiative success story. So these are currently um, City of Delray Beach employees. May, you may recognize some faces. And there's, here's some more. And um, hopefully next year we'll have more success stories with our summer interns of this year. And that will be all. Well, thank you for your time. Again, my name is Sandra Cordova, Assistant HR Generalist. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. We have one more presentation, and that is from the Delray Beach Initiative to End Homelessness. Hey, Ezra. Hi. Uh, I'm Ezra Krieg, and I'm here uh, representing the, what the newly renamed Delray Beach Initiative to End Homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, the group, uh, after I couldn't believe it when we realized that the group has been in existence five years and kind of have now been looking at what it's been doing in the past and what it needs to be doing in the future. And we think that the name encompasses really what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring our, our city together to not just battle homelessness as an issue, but to end it in our community. Uh, next slide, please. Just a little timeline for you. Uh, in 2015, the police department in, uh, uh, identified an increase in unsheltered people in our community. They looked to a number of different sources to try to find ways to um, meet this challenge. Uh, in 2016, the Homeless Task Force was initiated to work with our police department and other community organizations to have a Delray Beach uh, response to the challenge of homelessness. In 2018, and we reported to you our progress, and now we, we're giving you an update in 2021. The next slide, please. What is homelessness? Homelessness is defined as an individual or a family who lack fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime housing 
due to loss of employment or income, behavioral health issues, et cetera. But really, the definition is a lot simpler than that. Homelessness is not having a home. And the way to end homelessness is to find homes for everybody. And that way, we don't have that challenge any longer. Next slide. One of, the, one of the confusions about homelessness, not just in Delray Beach, but across the United States, is what is people who are, is the issue of homelessness and has it, how it relates to the community. Because being homeless is a circumstance. It's not a behavior. It's not an action. It's a circumstance. And many times when we try to deal with homelessness or we see homelessness as a challenge, we see it as a challenge because of the behavior of the people who are experiencing homelessness. Our police department is lauded throughout uh, Palm Beach County and throughout South Florida because the, our police department recognizes the difference and has been able to understand that people may be homeless, but are not uh, people who are causing problems in our community. There are people who cause problems in our community who may be homeless, and there are lots of them who are housed as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's an important distinction that people have to understand so that then we can deal with the issue of homelessness and try to deal with that separately. Next slide. So what did we tell you about in 2018? We told you that there are 20 plus uh, organizations and a number of individuals who come together monthly to work on the issue of homelessness in our community. We told you that we worked on the point in time count. Point in time count is a national census of homelessness in this country usually held in the last week of January of each year, where we come together and we try, and it's very difficult to do it, but we try to count the number of homeless people in our community so we can see whether the initiatives that we're doing are positive or negative, Have it, has it affect the total. We told you about our Mini Connect and our Project Homeless Connect, which was designed to try to get services to folks who are in need in our community. We told you about the No Hungry Child program in the schools. We, have, we had identified at the time approximately 100 children in the Delray Beach public schools that are, were defined as homeless by our, our Palm Beach uh, school department. We recognize that one of the issues of having that many children homeless in the schools was weekends and weekend feeding. And, and there had been studies published that said that kids who were homeless in the schools over the weekends had increased behavioral problems, had difficulty learning, and had also uh, absences on the Monday following. And a lot of that had to do with not having adequate nutrition over the weekend. So we initiated a program working with an organization called Living Hungry that allowed us to provide backpacks full of food for the child and for their family over the weekend. And the studies that were done after that indicated that a lot of the behavioral issues that had come up with these children dissipated. And we told you that as an organization and as individuals, we tried to get very involved in the formulation of the city's comprehensive plan so that the voice of those who are homeless in our community, as well as the people who are, have the compassion for them, could be heard. The next slide, please. And this talks about some of the successes that came, came out through that. Uh, that our point in st time studies indicated that for our, our initial count in 2018, there were over 100 people living on our streets in Delray Beach. And by 2021, we're, we are now down to 81. That we found a permanent home for the shower truck 
Some of you may know that we have a shower truck that operates two times a week and allows people who are homeless and do not have access to showers, we're able to provide showers to them twice a week. That has a lot of effect, not just on the person who gets the shower. Think about how you feel when you don't get a chance to bathe, maybe daily, maybe every, uh, every other day. These folks get a chance to bathe twice a week. We wish it was more. But that allows them the opportunity then to maybe seek employment or to be able to do things in our community. But it also helps our entire community because we provide new clothing and so on so that our community has an opportunity to look and feel its best. We, um, and that shower truck has provided nearly 3,000 showers since its inception. We implemented with our library the Wash and we Read program. It provides an opportunity to have, uh, allow folks to do their laundry. And at the same time, there's a book club associated with it. Because one of the things that a lot of people don't understand about people who are homeless is a big form of, uh, of recreation and entertainment for our homeless population is reading because they don't have access to a lot of the things that the rest of us have. But books can be expensive, so we provide books through the library to that population and then give them an opportunity to discuss it with one another. And we also hosted, the last two years, the, uh, an observance of the Homeless Memorial Day. It's done on December 21st each year. It's the longest night of the year. And we take an opportunity to recognize and, and uh, commemorate the names of people who are homeless in our community who have died on the streets. Next slide. We have a, a number of, of uh, partners in what we do. The initiative doesn't do any services directly. What we try to do is try to get people working together, and we try to enhance the services that everybody is able to do. So among our partners, and I don't have slides on all of them, but wanted to give you just a couple of highlights. Uh, Karen Kitchen, who's been in just an incredible partner in what we're doing. They provide meals five days a week to folks on uh, lunch every day, five days a week to folks. We also, uh, they have also been able to provide eyeglasses uh, help the folks get uh, homeless declarations, free bus passes, and more. Next slide. Our Interfaith Committee. We have uh, our Interfaith Committee, which is an incredible group that represents 11 uh, interfaith groups in our community. They provide a whole lot of uh, services, predominantly the shower truck, which they operate twice a week. They provide hygiene kits, fresh clothing. They manage mail. Think about it. If you're homeless, how do you get your mail? The Interfaith Committee be, is able to do that. They've helped with employment and a whole lot more. And it's a real great partnership of folks of faith who have worked together to try to help our neighbors in need. Next slide. Delray Beach is an envy of uh, communities throughout Palm Beach County, throughout South Florida. Um, just recently, I got a call from a city commissioner in Fort Lauderdale. They'd like to bring their new uh, police chief. Chief, I hope you'll join me in welcoming him, as well as some of their city commissioners, to come see what's going on in Delray Beach because they're just, they want to see how it works because they've got challenges that they think we can offer some assistance with. And it's, and it's because of our police department and our incredible uh, community outreach team, and uh, in particular, Ariana Ciancia, who uh, has done so much. Um, there, uh, the, our community is, spends a great deal of time through, the, through that, the community outreach team 
working with people. You know, you can't, you can't get somebody to make a change the first time you meet them. But it's through relationships, through example, through getting services to folks, we can make a difference in somebody's life. And that's where Ariana, Damien, Matt, and the rest of the police department have worked so hard to be able to provide that. You see the numbers just in 2020 of what this uh, group has done. Um, but there's, there's even more. In 2020, because of the pandemic, some of the things were limited. And you look and you say, well, only 16 people were placed in shelter. Well, part of the problem was that there wasn't shelter beds available because of the pandemic. But in 2021, that number is already 45 people. So that's 45 people who have been taken off the streets in Delray Beach, who are now have heads on beds, as we like to say, and that are, are not, not in our community, but, in, uh, but um, working hard to try to find ways to integrate back into society and be contributors to our society. Out of the 45 people, nine have been placed in permanent supportive housing. These are folks who are gonna, your neighbors, who are taxpayers, who, do th who are part of our community. And that's because of this outstanding police department that we have. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Family Promise. And I thought we had some interns from Family Promise. Oh, they're here today. Hi. Uh, the Family Promise program. Yeah, as you can again see, you can see the numbers. I want to specifically mention the internship program. The internship program provides social service help to the folks who are living on the streets. So these folks are the two interns who are here today. Work with these folks, find out what entitlements they're supposed to get, what kinds of services they need, what forms, federal forms need to be filled out, and they work with those folks. So that, and, and this is important for a very important reason. One of the reasons why uh, our community outreach team is so successful in placing people in shelter is that folks, we, we make sure that the folks who get, who get the opportunity for shelter are ready for it, that all the paperwork is done, that everything that they need, all the kinds of services, IDs and so on, have already been done. And that way we're able to get the folks into shelter uh, effectively. We're, we are number one in, this, in, in the Palm Beach County of getting folks into the county's homeless assistance system. Next slide. Living Hungry, which is here based in Delray Beach, has worked with us in trying to help feed fo uh, children who are hungry in the schools. Uh, you can look at the, look at the numbers. Uh, 117 homeless children were um, fed in 2019 and 2020, and we're now working on our uh, fundraising and our initiative to make sure that in 2021 and 22, all of the homeless children in our community will be served. So where do, our next slide please. So where do we go from here? Well, we, we've started with changing the name of the organization. We are looking at a transition at some point to a 501c3 organization, although we don't, it's not a burning thing that we want to do right now. Um, we have developed a website to, to be a communications tool between all of our organizations. Hopefully that website will go live this week. I was hoping that I could announce tonight that it was live, but there were some glitches uh, when we were working on it over the weekend. So uh, hopefully by the end of the week, we'll have a live website that both our organizations and our community can come see what's going on and see how they can help. We are looking into the possibility of implementing a day drop-in center one of the concerns of the uh, city commission has been people who are homeless um, collecting in the downtown area. 
We think that one of the ways we can help uh, work with that challenge is find a place indoors with air conditioning that they could go and get services and get programs and services and not be collecting in that downtown area. Hopefully we'll have some more information about the, the possibility. We did get a donor who um, gave us the money to do a implementation plan, a feasibility plan for this program and we'll be reporting to you all on the results of that soon. We uh, continue to try to support and we'll continue to advocate for the expansion of the community outreach team. They are a gem in our community and should be supported in every way possible. We will be doing another point in time in September of this year. If there are people here sitting here today or including our city commissioners who would like to have a really interesting experience we would love you to join us when we go out in september to count people who are homeless in our community it's a four-hour commitment that will give you a lifetime of experience because you'll learn a little bit about how people are living in our community and why they're living in the way they are we uh, will continue to support the shower truck continue our support of all of the nonprofits who are part of us. Now these slides were done a couple of months ago. I did want to give you just a couple of the updates that are not contained in the slides. One is the effort that was done to vaccinate our homeless population. We did that not only for the people who are homeless in their community, but we did it for you to help you be protected. And we were able through a partnership with the county, with the healthcare district, and so on, and our incredible friends at the Interfaith Committee, uh, we were able to provide vaccinations for 50 of uh, people who are homeless in our community. Um, we, uh, those of you know that the last time I was in front of you, we had a, um, a spirited conversation about the panhandling ordinance. Right, Commissioner? That's right. Uh, and uh, we, uh, and let me just go back to the vaccination. I want to say something, and this is just as a citizen of Delray Beach. Commissioner Frankel and I had a disagreement about the panhandling ordinance. Um, and then uh, I was trying to get our folks vaccinated. And somebody suggested to me, call uh, Adam Frankel. And I was a little reluctant. We, we had had a, a disagreement about this ordinance. But I said, OK, I'm going to call Adam Frankel. And I called Adam Frankel. And I explained what was going on. And I explained a connection that potentially he had. And I didn't get a call back from Adam Frankel. I actually got a call back from the governor's office in the state of Florida who said, we'll come in, when do you want us to come vaccinate those folks? And so it says something about having an honest disagreement, but then working together to try to uh, help our community. And uh, I have a lot of respect. Uh, I always have had respect, but I have a lot more from, from that. Um, we, uh, we had this thing about the um, uh, ordinance the commission made a decision to implement it. Our committee is working with our police department and with Assistant Chief Sapino to try to get it implemented in a way that will help, help the people in our community rather than hurt them, and I appreciate that. And lastly, this is really exciting. Uh, as, as you know, I'm uh, on the board of the Delray Beach Housing Authority. The Housing Authority was given 30 vouchers, market rate rent, that we could provide to people who are homeless, near homeless, or victims of domestic violence. This was an incredible uh, program through the federal government that we've been able to get. We developed, we worked with the partnership of folks from the uh, initiative, and I'm really excited to report to you that we issued the 30 vouchers, so there were 30 folks who, are, who potentially could be homeless in our community who have vouchers for market rate rent. As of today, we have 
place three families in apartments with those vouchers. We have three pending. We are certainly looking for units because we've got folks with rent to pay. So if any of you've got units that we can utilize, we've, we've got folks that we can get off the street into apartments with rent, rent that will be paid until 2030. It's a great accomplishment for our community that we'll be able to do. Very good. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. This is just a few of the folks that are working with us on this. Uh, we're the only community in, in Palm Beach County that has a program like this. We're the only community in, Del in Palm Beach County whose point in time count reduces every year. This is a success story for our community, but it's not a story that's ended yet. It won't end until we've eliminated homelessness in our community. Uh, we thank the City Commission for your support, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that any of you might have. Thank you very much. So appreciate it. Um, that was very thorough. I uh, appreciate everything that uh, that you have done, Ezra. You have led this charge for as long as I've sat up here, and it's it's been pretty amazing. Um, I just have to say, um, you know, uh, say that about you because uh, you you've really kind of like been that person, that point person. And um, just for the audience's edification, you know, that point in time count is really um, it's it the, all of this marries together. And if we did not have the team that was working in the police department, Ariana, um, all of your support over the years and what you've been doing, we would not see that go down. I think that unfortunately we would see it go up instead of down. So this is really a great accomplishment and I'm not surprised at all that there are other um, cities out there that are reaching out to Delray Beach to find out how it is that we're doing this and how we're getting it right. And I know that there's a lot of times um, people who are very, they don't, they don't, realize the things that are being that are happening in town and people like you Ezra um, leading the charge it has made all the difference and and certainly um, the support of the locals um, these these organizations right up here um, have made all the difference in the world for so many lives in Delray Beach so I'm grateful for that so thank, thank you. you very much for everything you're doing anyone else thank you. Uh, Ezra excuse me Ezra, I was I just wanted to thank you as well. Um, but also, if we could just take a moment, I, I just wanted to say thank you to Damien. I know he's not here, but Chief Sims, I don't know if anybody saw that post on Facebook. I know that you all worked together to place a woman in her own apartment who was previously homeless. And as of yesterday, I believe, she was sleeping on a floor, but he reached out on Facebook and asked for donations of bed, TV, and furniture. I think the uh, response was overwhelming, and I just, I can't, I speak for the entire commission when I say we appreciate him and the whole police department so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. Vice Mayor. I, I wanted to... Don't want to take away any applause. Uh, I wanted to just thank you. You've been a tireless warrior and in advocating for those who may just not be able to do as most of us try to do, and that's remain in a home, in a place uh, with a roof over our heads. I'm surprised. I know why you didn't put them all up there, but there are more partners and organizations because the last time I was at your meeting, there was standing room only. We were, the, the, the place was just packed with people. They came because you were coming. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> but thank you for that. <laughs> but uh, I think they come because they want to be a part of this wonderful uh, opportunity of showing how Delray Beach is not only a place for just the, those who have, it's a place for those who have not. So thank you for all of your hard work. I'm going to be working with the uh, chief on an idea I mentioned that the goal setting, and how long ago was that that I haven't even been able to get with him. So I, I do truly want to do a little bit more, and I think the city can. So we look forward to working out that opportunity if the commissioners are going to agree to it later. Super. Thank you. And, and count me in for your po uh, point in time. Okay. I will do it. All right. Thank It'll you. be quite an experience. I'm sure it will. Very good. Thank you. Thank you again. Okay, so we're moving on now to um, uh, agenda item five, comments and inquiries on agenda and non-agenda items from the public. 
Um, we're going to start with the city manager for a response for any prior public comments. If there are none at this time, Madam Mayor. Okay, very Thank good. You. So, if the public would like to come forward, anybody that would like to speak um, to the commission, um, what you need to do is to sign in. You can do that afterwards. Uh, state your name, your address, and you'll have three minutes. And if anybody's here that wants to speak longer than. Any comments? Yes, right up here. Anybody who would like to come up and speak? This would be your time. And this is for any items uh, on the agenda or non agenda, as long as they're not uh, public hearing or quasi judicial. I'm a new face. Um, so, uh, Madam Mayor and Commissioners, my name is Emily Kanopka. My address is 12990 Blue Lake Drive, Wellington, Florida. I am here today representing Old School Square as the newly appointed chairman of the board, and I am joined by many of the staff members and board members as well today. In June of 2007, my family and I visited Delray Beach on a house hunting trip. Um, we were relocating here to South Florida. We found the Cornell Art Museum listed along with various theatrical performances at the Crest Theater to experience while we were on our relocation journey and we quickly fell in love. We've now lived here for 14 years and I have served Old School Square as a volunteer, patron, donor, and board member. I bring to the organization 30 years of retail executive leadership experience, an educational background of human resource management and communications, along with my personal passion of the arts as a musician, thespian, and debater. The past 16 months through a pandemic have negatively impacted so many in our community, and Old School Square is incredibly grateful to have made it through. We were able to make necessary changes, which included updates to our outdoor facilities that continued bringing live entertainment to Delray Beach in a safe, secure, and socially distanced environment. So much so that we drew the attention of a little known artist known as Jimmy Buffett. We are responding to our opportunities and learnings from this past year. We have relaunched our membership program and taken action to secure a grant writer that is being underwritten for six months through a generous private donation. We will improve our response times to the community by expanding current staffing levels that will include a community experience administrator and searching for an executive leader. The Crest Theater will be reopening this fall with expanded virtual and in-person course offerings continuing in the Creative Arts School. And our Cornell Art Museum is hosting the upcoming Squares on the Square and Indie Art Festival. We will continue hosting some of the city's holiday activities that include our famous 100-foot tree and have a lineup of world-class live entertainment options at the pavilion. I plan to continue providing these updates regularly and I invite each of you to participate with our staff and board of directors in our monthly meetings. I believe in our mission, value, and vision statements that emphasize providing accessible programs and services through a team of dedicated staff and volunteers who embrace cultural diversity and work to establish strong partnerships. We continue to honor and protect our historic buildings through a generous $2.4 million private donation for the museum renovation and current renovation of the Crest Theater building and provide an even more enhanced experience for our community. Okay, thank you. Um, your time is up, but if there are six people that don't want to speak or will not speak, if they raise their hands, you'll have another three minutes. You got it. Okay, so go ahead and give her an extra. Go okay. ahead, finish up. Um, as my daughter said nearly 14 years ago, and Gold Knowles, by the way, she yep. graduated from go. Florida State. Good deal. This is truly a magical place. With the continued support from the city, members, volunteers, generous donors and staff. The legacy of Old School Square, began by Francis Burke back here, will continue to be a place where members are made, memories are made, and lives are enriched. And as an ad, since I got some more time, we would like to give back today 
by donating two outdoor tickets to any pavilion event for the employee of the month go forward. Congratulations, mm -hmm. Anthony. Very good, nice. Thank you. Oh, extra bonus for, for one of our employees, so appreciate that. Thank you. Anyone else from the audience would like to speak? Seeing no one, public comment is currently closed. Moving on to the consent agenda. We had some changes, so if we can have motion a motion. to approve as amended. Second. Okay, call the roll, please. Mr. Bowles. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Okay. We are with at, at uh, 7A, which is a discussion of um, the things that occurred at, in Surfside that we had added to the agenda. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. And thanks for your words. So appreciate it. So um, this is an interesting uh, topic, and I know that we have limitations and restrictions as to what we can do. Um, city, I'm sorry, the county is in a very different situation than counties south of us, Dade and Broward. Um, I received a lot of calls, a lot of inquiries about safety and what we're doing to move forward on safe issues within the city. And I'm not so sure that um, we can um, resolve these issues today, but it's something that I think that just bringing up the subject and where we want to go with this might be a good time. And I'm going to recognize, it looks like uh, Commissioner Casal wants to be recognized, so you can um, say what you want to say, and then we'll, we'll have the I city commission. Mine are more to. questions, because I think, and just in reviewing that, Palm Beach County Just put your, um, put your, yeah. There you oh, go. Thank you. my apologies. It is, seems that Palm Beach County doesn't have a required inspection of existing buildings of a certain age or height, correct? So, um, but the Florida Building Code uh, gives us authority to inspect only permitted work. Is that right? Uh, existing and new structures. So only if an unsafe situation is brought to our attention for further review would we, ran, uh, would we randomly inspect. Is that correct? And is that this? I think that's the same in Broward and Dade. And so wait, I'll just go on so then you can have it all and then you can <laughs> give it back to me. So if a structural engineer is hired by a building's owner or HOA, they have no obligation whatsoever to notify us if they find an issue of concern, I believe. And then lastly, should we be asking the state of Florida or the county to address the uh, need for inspections on a periodic basis? Thank you. Those are if you'd like me to. Yeah, and I was going to say, I know that we have some things that are ongoing right now. We have our, our, our building official working with the county, so that was the one thing I wanted to let um, the city bring up us up to date on where that is. And then if it doesn't go far enough, if there's something that we would want to see as far as differences in our policies. So before you answer, I'm going to go ahead and give uh, Vice Mayor an opportunity, and then you guys can just handle whatever questions, I mean, answers that you can answer. You got it. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, so I'm, am I to understand that there is nothing in our codes, ordinances, whatever, that would allow us to, if we are contacted by any resident in this city, that there is nothing that would uh, allow our code to come and say, this is an unsafe building, we need to evacuate. Damn it. Nothing. No, that, that's not accurate. So we do have an unsafe building um, portion of our code, a section in our code. We've actually had to use it recently. And it does allow the building official to essentially make a determination that a building is unsafe and either demand repairs, vacate the premises, or condemn the building. What we're talking about with Surfside is that Palm Beach County and Dade County seem to have a 40-year certification inspection requirement. It's, it's Broward County. You Sorry, said Palm I Beach. said Palm Beach. Yeah. Broward and Miami-Dade. We don't have it. And it requires um, an inspection at the 40-year mark in order to ensure that the building is safe and structurally sound and things like that. So we don't have that currently, but there are provisions in our code. For example, if we receive an anonymous complaint that there are concerns about a building, it does allow our code enforcement and our building official to go out, inspect the property, and make that determination. Um, if the building is found to be unsafe, then there are provisions in the code that allow us to move forward in order to you know, have the community make the requisite repairs or in an extreme situation, order that the building be condemned. 
So the case that brought this to our attention, which to me was a very uh, surfside similar uh, condition, it, um, and I don't know if we're allowed to discuss it. Are we allowed to discuss it? We're not it's allowed. It's an to open code matter. Okay, so very I don't good, thank it. you. So in case the public is unaware of, which, of what we're discussing, as far as we know, the uh, code enforcement department was told in February that there was an unsafe condition, and they did or did not. They contacted the owner of the building, and what happened then? So I'm not aware of the exact dates. Um, let's, this is a community, so it's comprised of several buildings. They received a complaint about one of the buildings that it was un, you know, unsafe. Um, our chief building official um, inspected the building, contacted the attorney in the um, condo association, and required a structural engineer's report. The report indicated that if certain measures were taken. Would you give us a time frame if you, for what you know? You know, I don't know Ball the part. dates of, of when the complaint was received. I know what happened recently, but as far as um, Because that's very important. I, I'm just going on what I read in the paper. And no, if you don't have the information, then that's all well and good. But I think it's important that the commissioners understand exact timeline as to what, as far as we know, officially has happened. Mr. Walthour is here. I think he can brief you on the dates. Good afternoon, Commission. Sam Walthour, Interim Director of Neighborhood and Community Services Department. <clears throat> the complaint specific to the unsafe uh, was uh, received in early June. The, you referenced February. That was a maintenance issue that the uh, code enforcement dealt with as well. But as far as the overall unsafe, that was early June, and we moved quickly to make sure that we address that from the code perspective, working, of course, along with the can building official. Can you share with us what the maintenance was? Were they, did they physically go on the premise? We always go, if we have a complaint, we always, if we have access to the, to the property, we, we go on the property and do an inspection. There was some railing and some other issues that were mentioned earlier in February uh, about the property. The unsafe that led to where we are right now, that happened earlier in June. Okay, so once we went there and we saw the condition, and if the pictures are accurate, uh, I don't understand why there wasn't an immediate uh, rally around the citizens, the residents. Uh, if someone, if I lived in a place like that, whether I could afford to move somewhere or not, I would be deathly afraid that the building was going to fall because. In order to, I think, I'm just going to throw out some numbers, correct me if I'm, in, if I'm wrong, there are at least 30 to 40 jacks yep. that are holding the building up, holding the second floor up. Right. Let me give just a little bit of background on that. After we initiated the case and the building went, uh, the case went to the building official, was deemed unsafe, uh, the the HOA Association was required to produce an engineer's letter. That letter, in effect, said the building is habitable. It needed to be shored up uh, with additional support and that the repairs should commence immediately. So, so we have no idea as to how long the ones that were there had been there. I don't, and I, then the recommendation by this engineer was to put more there was to, one, shore up the building with additional support and that repairs should commence immediately. That, that was the essence of the engineer's letter. So with that, the additional jacks that were seen in the photos were put up as an additional support. Beyond that, uh, the association was required to uh, have a permit, get a permit for the repairs. That permit was uh, applied for, building department quickly uh, approved it, and then we were waiting on the association to actually pay and pick up the permit. That's what prompted uh, code enforcement with res to go out and, and um, make sure that that was happening. What 11 days. It? I'm sorry, sir, what prompted? What, what they I was, not pick up the permit? They did not pick up the permit timely. About 11 days passed, and we forced the issue by uh, having it taken to the magistrate, 
which then the magistrate required them to commence repairs within seven days, asked code enforcement to do daily inspections, and uh, if, they, if the work wasn't going to commence within that time frame, then there was going to be a daily $1,000 a day fine uh, levied on the uh, association. So in, in, in essence, we had an unsafe condition. It was taken to a magistrate after it appeared that the HOA, then if you near, would um, research and listen to what was put in the paper, uh, those few that you saw, I don't know how many, nobody's giving me a number, one is too many, um, were there for more than a year? I don't, I don't have the time frame on how long any of the jacks were there, but I do know that after um, the engineer's report went out, they put additional jacks up to support the, the, sh the reshoring uh, of the building. That's where you saw additional pole jacks that were placed up there. Yeah, I'm just thoroughly disappointed. I'm but Commissioner, disappointed. If, if I could, um, for us, when the complaint happened with respect to the building being unsafe in early June, our department, along with uh, the building official, moved as quickly as possible to address the issue. So in very short order, we went from the building being deemed unsafe to the association having to apply for a permit to uh, the department forcing the issue of a magistrate to hear the issue to make sure that we were moving quickly. So now we're going on to two months. No, no, no. We, I'm, I'm saying in a matter of about three weeks, all of this has happened. Mm -hmm. And so now the repairs have been happening over the last week. According to the contractor, uh, those, re those repairs should be completed this week. And that's the one building that had the uh, pole jacks that you've seen the photos of. Well, I'm happy to see that the uh, two departments were working together. My concern, uh, Mayor and Commissioners, is that we may have others of this. And because we may or may not have someone who's going to come forward and say this is happening, um, I, I don't even know how we found out that it's happening, except there was maintenance. I, Mr. Walton did not explain thoroughly to me how we went there the first time. I, don't know. Could you have driven by and see it? I've seen it. I don't know. But uh, how many of these buildings exist? How many of them, there are HOAs that aren't doing what they should be doing? I think that the city is um, a little lax in not having something that would allow us to have taken care of this problem. True or not, I was read that it was there at least a year. Now, unfortunately, the residents in some of our buildings are fearful. They don't have any other option of moving to some other place or obtaining short-term rental, et cetera. If you leave the building, you still are obligated. I'm sure those landlords are going to take you off to court and say you haven't met your rental agreement. So I'm, I'm, I just would don't know where to go except I do not want to be the next surf site. And because we might not have, well, we do have some buildings on uh, the east side of the Intracoastal, and I know we have some on, on the um, A1A, on the beach side of A1A, which is the east side. Have we done everything that we can do to make sure that these types of things aren't happening? And I don't know that we need to wait for the state. I would rather err on the side of starting something, making a list of these buildings. How old are they? Can we, do we know? Do we have anything that's automated that we can pull up and say, we have 40 buildings that are 13, nobody knows 13, 14 of more stories, two stories. Um, when was the last time that anyone made a visit there? I don't say go and, and uh, barge in, but if it's open and you can see, as this building was, we should have been on this because it doesn't look like it just started yesterday, June, or a year ago. Can I just say one thing? So there's two ways that code enforcement can get involved. The first is if somebody applies for a building permit and we do an inspection pursuant to that permit and we notice something, then we, the city can move forward with those concerns. The second way is that the way that we got involved this time is somebody makes a complaint to the city and we go out and inspect it. And we routinely do that. 
people do have property rights, and we always have to be mindful of that, that we just can't go on somebody's property and conduct an inspection you know, because we believe that we're in the right. So we always have to have a legal basis in order to do these things. And that's why that certification program, that gives the city a basis to enter the property and do these inspections and things like that. So we have to, it's, it's a balancing test, right? You know, yes, th that building was unsafe and the city made the argument to the magistrate that you can't just displace people. You know, you just can't give people 48 hours notice to vacate the premises and, you know, until the building is repaired. You know, the other side of it is there's only so much money that the city can spend. I mean, should the city of Delray Beach taxpayers have to fund these repairs when there's a condo association that's presumably collecting money to maintain these buildings and keep them in a safe, um, safe uh, manner? You have to consider all these things. And so in our position, consulting with our resident expert, who's our chief building official, as well as with code enforcement, you know, we have to give every opportunity to correct and obviously do it in a safe manner. And when you have a structural engineer telling you that if you shore it up and you begin construction immediately, it's hard to go against that. If we had to go to court and we, you know, ordered, you know, that the building be condemned, we'd probably lose because we have an expert telling us that this is what you need to do. The reason why we took action is because my definition of immediately is not waiting 11 days to pick up a permit. And there was no sense of urgency on behalf of the um, association. I'm happy to report that it does appear that construction has commenced. It looks like it's going to be done before the end of the week. And so from that perspective, the city got what it wanted, and that was to have a safe building. Now it's up to the association to maintain that. Frankly, the city should never have to get involved in these situations, right? If the homeowners association is doing what they need to do, our involvement should be non-existent. And, and it wasn't in this case, which is why we got involved. And I'm, ha I'm happy with that outcome. I think it was the right thing for those residents. And when you look at it globally and, and big picture, you know, to displace 40 residents from a home who probably don't have the funds or the means to be able to secure a new residence, I think, you know, getting this done in a matter of two weeks is a huge accomplishment for our staff. Yes, I'd like to thank you for that. Uh, someone said, I think Mr. Waltham said, that there were two others in this complex buildings that perhaps were done at the same time are we because this one is in this shape do we then have the right to inspect the other two and we have and so those also received a notice of unsafe structure violation surprise, now, surprise. unfortunately they're appealing that which is really disappointing um, because you would think that with everything that's gone on in that community that they would take even more initiative to maintain the other buildings and we'll deal with it, you know. We're, we're not in a position to back down. We believe that these residents are entitled to live in a safe and habitable home. And until that happens, you know, the city will litigate if we have to in order to ensure that that process commences and is completed. I, Thank you for that. And um, I think, Julie, you. you had some questions. Did they get answered or not really? And I think so. I just, I think what you're saying makes great sense. Thank you. And I also think in light of the current environment, we'll probably be receiving a lot of calls with people asking us to, you know, verify if their building is safe. But I would like the residents to know, and this is my understanding, that the Florida Building Code gives us authority to inspect only permitted work on existing or new construction. So this wouldn't be something, so an unsafe situation only comes to our attention for further review uh, if we wouldn't be randomly inspecting. So that is correct. If I may, I do have some, yes. some points I'd like to make and address with the commission. Um, but as our attorney um, stated, essentially, you are correct. The Florida Building Code um, does not give us unilateral authority to just step on a property. You know, there are property rights involved um, specific to that question. We would inspect and send code enforcement, code compliance out when we receive concerns or complaints, which this is how we obviously addressed the situation um, that we have been discussing. So that's one of the points I wanted to make. Um, I, I did think that it would be probably um, prudent to have a bit of a discussion in terms of some of the things that we are looking to do as a city in light of what has uh, occurred. Um, and so if that would be appropriate time, I'd like to share that with you. First, we've discussed this. The um, Palm Beach County League of Cities, um, guided by Palm Beach County, has put together a subcommittee of all the building officials in the county and they're charged with taking a look at this on a countywide basis, which we completely support. I think I, there was a question on the status of that. The first meeting was, uh, I believe, last Friday. The next meeting is this Friday, and we're very happy to have a seat at the table regarding that. Um, 
a unified approach does make sense. It does, um, it would be very helpful for our staff, it would be helpful for the construction industry and so on. However, we do also recognize that um, as our city moves forward, um, if, it's, uh, if it can be too complex or too burdensome or if just take too long for the taste of our city because we don't have some of the complexities of some of those high rise buildings that would have to be addressed in other areas of the county. So in other words, what I'm saying is if we need to move forward in a quicker fashion, um, we'd be work working with our attorney to figure out what we could do at the local level, you know, in, in line with the county as well as the Florida Building Code to move quicker if, if so be it. But we do have a very good sense of confidence from the county that they are looking at this um, very closely and they are wanting to act very quickly. So we're here to support them in that effort in any way that we can. Um, Something that also has been recently done, which we think is a best practice and we intend to send out by the end of this week, uh, would be letters. Um, um, Vice Mayor, you requested, you asked, do we know the, the ages of some of these properties? So what we intend to do would be to send out letters to these properties um, based on age. We're working with Development Service to, um, to basically extract that information from, the, from our systems and send those reminders out. Send them a reminder that says, you know, you are in charge of the maintenance of these buildings. If you have an older facility, 35, 40, whatever the, those years are, um, it's time to get a structural engineer to go out and provide you with a, an update as to the condition of, of that building. So we, we do intend to send that out um, by the end of this week. Um, sorry, I'm trying to make sure I capture everything. Um, I think that is generally the gist of what we are doing now. And obviously we are also hoping that through the subcommittee with the League of Cities and through that engagement of all 39 cities, we would learn other best practices or other initiatives that we can take upon ourselves and do so very quickly. Okay. Um, sure. Anything else? Yes, that would, thank you. Um, is it possible that you can provide not the names, the address or anything, just the number of buildings that don't know how far back our record, records go, how many buildings are 50, 45, 30, 35, uh, 10 years old, and how high they are. Because I would not want to ever have to, is that something impossible? No, I, we, I, if I'm wrong, and Thea, please correct me, but we can work with our IT department to um, query the system that we have right now and extrapolate as much of that data as we can. I'm not sure that every single piece of that inquiry would, would align, just number, but yes. Just the number of the buildings and how old they are. And That's exactly what we're trying to use in order to send these reminder letters out. So we would be extracting that information. Everything that we can do with our, depart our IT department, we will get that. I do have a couple other points to make um, very briefly since we are on the subject. Um, I know there's a lot of focus on the building, um, the building aspect of it, but it's, what has occurred in Surfside has basically had every professional that works in public service reevaluating um, their operations, whether they're a county, whether a city, what have you, the state, the federal government, every level, every public servant is looking at their operations. And so I know we talk a lot about the building um, part of this. I did wanna also talk a little bit about the emergency response to this because it really has us thinking, what are our plans? What are our COOP plans? And I wanted to advise you that as of yesterday, we did have three firefighters that were called to Surfside to aid in the search and rescue operation. So we will have uh, three firefighters there for seven days, and depending, of, of course, on how long that operation continues, we might have, obviously, other members of our team ready and willing to assist in the search and rescue operation. So I just wanted to bring that to the Commission's attention since we are talking about that at this moment. Is this our side called us and asked us to release three of our members? Yes. So this is a volunteer? No, these are our firefighters. It's a volunteer by our firefighters. We're not necessarily, we're just allowing them if they choose to do it. I'm just no, looking at how we're sending issues. three. We, we are sending three. This is, yes. And we also, um, under the FEMA declaration of assistance, we are assisting with that effort. And hopefully, under the public assistance, we'd also be able to be reimbursed for that effort. Chief Tommy, if you have anything to add. 
I know you're right on point. Uh, we will be reimbursed for the, the, the people that go down there and assist at Surfside and any overtime that's occurred, occurred here at home, they'll be reimbursed, 100% reimbursable. It's not the 2575 like it normally is in a hurricane. It'll be 100% reimbursable. So why was Delray selected? I mean, we've got all these municipalities throughout the state. What would, what would cause them to come to Delray to ask? So them? they actually um, came to um, Palm Beach County mm -hmm. and said that we need 30 personnel from Palm Beach County to go and assist for the Bravo shift at Surfside. So we gave three firefighter personnel, so did West Palm, so did Palm Beach County, you know, every municipality for the most part in Palm Beach County. I don't know exactly who participated, but I do know the request was for 30 from Palm Beach County. So we're sending, Delray is sending three down there for the uh, Bravo shift midnight to uh, noon the next day for seven days, and that could be extended to another seven days. Mm -hmm. I just would like to say thank them for it, but I certainly hope that we keep track of these personnel because if anyone remembers what happened at the 9-11, it was a few years, not even that for yep. some of them. They're working in very dangerous situations and they're impacting our health and all the other things that go with this. And I'm just very concerned. I don't want anyone to be there, unfortunately. I don't even, didn't even want the building to fall, of course. But if we're going to do that, we're taking on more than just volunteers and paying them and all of that. We're also probably taking on their health. Unlike the World Trade Center, ma'am, we, we, they have uh, respiratory protection, state-of-the-art uh, P100s that they're wearing. Uh, they're actually issued that when they come on site. So there's not like uh, a municipality may have an inferior product. Everybody on that site is getting the same superior product when they go on the pile and start working. Anyone else? Just wanted to kind of... Um, roll back around to um, what uh, City Manager Jenna, Jennifer Alvarez was talking about in that, um, you know, there is uh, an effort on the local level, um, actually county level, in order to be able to kind of try to put something together. Uh, if it doesn't work out, we can do something more on a local level. But when you start to do it from a local level up, it becomes a piecework effect and it doesn't really work well across the board. It should start at the state level, work down to the county level, and then work down to the, to the local level. And fortunately, um, we have found ourselves in a situation where we're trying to do the work that should have been done way above us, um, you know, over and over again, start of the pandemic. We were, everybody was doing their own thing. That should have come from the top down. It's the same thing with something like this. It needs to come from the top down. And I have to tell you, in, in reading and understanding uh, how, um, you know, why things are being pushed off where you have, in some instances like this one, $16 million worth of damage in a, in a building that has not been saved for, it's basically because the state has permitted no, no reserves if the majority of a condo association decides that they don't want to reserve or, or, or put money into reserve. And that is really what is um, very perplexing from my perspective because the more that we see things failing, we're going to see people in situations that cannot you know, out, uh, come, come out from under. And the failure is sometimes just because there is a board that is going to have to assess themselves the money to be able to fix what hasn't been saved from the very beginning to now. That's really what is is perplexing. If the state, if the state representatives um, were doing their job in making sure that we had it from the top down, I don't think the locals would have to be looking at these things at all. That's the way I see it. Mayor, just may anyway. I have to say one more thing? Uh, um, we know the history of this state when it comes to safety. And I know that they are good at mandating without any funding. So I think due to the hazard to our citizens, we cannot wait and point and say the state isn't doing it. It should have been. No, we're not. I know. But I'm saying we should not wait for them because it will never happen. Uh, I'm of a very uh, low opinion of how this state operates when it comes to um, laws and regulations and safety we just haven't been there yep. and I don't see us being there even in light of what's happened because they have allowed thousands of buildings in this state to go up on the East Coast and the West Coast without any kind of law state level I'm sure there's something at the national maybe maybe not but I think Surfside should be a lesson to all of us Absolutely. but I don't see it happening at the state I'm very discouraged with what's going on there. Um, just not going to happen. So if we wait until the state 
or the county, and I'm, I'm happy that the county may be uh, jumping in and not waiting for the state, but if they even begin to back up, I would hope that Delray would take the, the initiative and not let that be the reason that uh, Delray becomes the next Surfside. Thank Just you. Just make sure that you understand that when a state makes a law, the city cannot impede that law. Oh, I understand that. Okay, so but I would I like to sure also, aware. When, when there's Absolutely. lawsuits, that if, it goes to the state also. If we can... If we can um, just direct, uh, if we can, uh, the city manager to give us an update another month on what has taken place in the county so that we kind of know where we're going, I think that would be a great uh, way to pursue, you know, what we know we need to do on a local level. Absolutely. I'd be happy to keep the commission updated um, even after every, every time the subcommittee meets, if it's not on a monthly um, basis sooner. So happy Sounds to do good. so. Perfect. All right. Any other questions on this? Moving on to 7BB, which was a 6G on the um, on the agenda, resolution number 106-21, and this was pulled off by the vice mayor. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I was very concerned about, was it 6 what? Not B. 6G. 6G. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Resolution yes. 6-21. Um, I just wanted to have a little discussion about it. It's um, something that I don't know you've been very concerned, Mayor, about our signing on to things. Not that the beach nourishment plan isn't wonderful, but it's a 50-50 deal. Mm -hmm. Once we take the grant, we've got to have money set aside. So do we, I didn't see any f numbers going along with this. So I'm just very concerned. Take a deep breath. <laughs> numbers. I'm ready. Does anyone have any numbers? Here we go, Missy. Good evening, Missy Barletto, Public Works Director. The resolution that's before you today is a requirement, an annual requirement by the DEP. It does not commit you to participate in any kind of, of uh, program unless the commission chooses to do so at a future date. This, uh, this agreement is in support of the beach renourishment program that we undertake about every eight years. We have planned on doing one this coming year. We are in discussions with the Army Corps of Engineers and the state about whether or not it's necessary this coming year because of the storm repair that was just done last year. So it may be in this year's budget, it may be put off another year. So I just wanted to, to give you a heads up on that because we've been saying all along that we were going to be doing it this coming year. But the federal government in general pays for half of the beach renourishment program. The state of Florida picks up half of the half that the federal government doesn't pay. And then the county picks up half of that half that's left over and then the city is is responsible for for the the part that's left over so the county and the city pay the same amount um, in the beach renourishment that we are looking at coming up those the um, numbers are approximately 17 million for the total beach renourishment project and the city's portion of that would wind up being about 1.8 million Thank you. That's what was concerning yeah. me because if we don't put it in the budget, we're going to have to take it from somewhere. And again, I haven't had my budget review. I don't know if there's something in there. Um, have we put anything in? Missy, do we have some fund money for that though? The beach fund doesn't, didn't we discuss that there was potentially money coming into that? There was some money coming in, and, and I just want to say that, that this is probably one of the most complicated programs financially to take a look at because there are so many players in right. this game. Um, there was about $457,000 in the federal budget that has been hanging out there since 2013-2014. And we did a beach renourishment, a full beach renourishment in 2013 that the city paid its portion of. And then, then the federal government came in and did a storm repair in 2014 that the county picked up the city's portion for. And at that time, the city and county entered into an agreement 
that the county would, would continue to pay the city's portion. There are discussions now about whether we're going, how we're going to move forward with, with continuing to do that contracting, whether that um, the county is not overly enthusiastic about continuing to pick up the city's portion, but the county's portion of the beach nourishment projects are covered by bed tax. Mm -hmm. So the city has to come up with it out of our general fund and the county comes up with that out of bed tax. So we have some we have some negotiations that we're doing. We're meeting with the Palm Beach County environmental resource folks on a very regular basis every month. We're meeting with the Corps of Engineers monthly and trying to get um, we're getting a six-year extension on the current deal that we have with the Corps of Engineers, which um, Delray Beach, you may or may not know, was one of the first cities to undergo a beach renourishment project. So we have a very sweet deal with the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, most places where they do these renourishment programs the local government has to come up with a lot more of the, the finances to do the project. So our current 50-year contract with the Corps of Engineers is set to sunset in 2023. We're working with them to get a six-year extension on that to take us all the way through 2029, which would give us not only the upcoming renourishment, but potentially the one to follow it as well. And during that time, then we can work on getting a, a, a better understanding with the federal government. They, you know. Very good. Thank you. And I'd like to point out, and I think I can share the pictures. Uh, I'll send them to you. Uh, Susan LeBron shared some photos with me. She lives on the section of the beach that's private and or did and wasn't being renourished, and it's problematic if you don't. There was approximately five foot straight down drop. So I um, thank you, Missy, and I will make a motion to uh, approve resolution 10621. Second. Thank you. Well, the I do have something else to say, but I'll leave it. Oh, oh, did you I'm sorry. To? I apologize. You can discuss right now. Well, I'm just very concerned that we are obligating ourselves, and I know this is something that needs to be done, but it's another on no I think Missy said we're not financially obligating ourselves we so don't actually have to do this if we choose not to we just we just won't ourselves. have the opportunity if we don't pass this resolution well, I understand all of yeah. that okay. I just I just like to put some money in the kitty right. so that should it happen no. we're not right. going oh we've got to take some money out of the general fund we, we, we didn't will. think about this well, I, I, I would like to add that, that this resolution that's on the agenda this evening puts us in line to apply for local government funding um, through, through the legislature. So we will put in our local government funding request again, and we do that in the June, July, August time frame annually. This year, Delray Beach's renourishment project was the top ranked beach project in the state. So we're number one on the list. We're definitely in the in the mill for in the run for funding. We and we were also funded over three million dollars last year and we had funding the year before. So we, we had get funding. We were, we had money, three million dollars that we did or did not use. It's awarded to us. We haven't used it yet because it will go toward the renourishment program. So when we do the renourishment project, then all of those funds will roll forward into, into Delray Beach. So we have something that we've already maybe received. All we need to do is just plug in a number. And that was all I was asking. Let's plug in, I don't know if we need to do it here, but i just like to have the knowledge that there's something. I didn't get that from this. Yeah, it may not be that we use it this year because what what Mrs. Understood. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. We'll still apply for it. Oh, of course. And we'll still get some funding. So, so we do it every year, regardless of whether there's a uh, renourishment project or not. Can uh, you tell me, did Ms. Uh, LeBron say why the beach nourishment didn't go there because it's considered private property? It's private, so. What so that's another reason that no one should ever own the beach. 
I might disagree. Maybe I don't on the beach. But I apologize for cutting you off. I thought you were that's, done. That's so my right. apologies. Okay, okay, I'm slow in processing good? all of this. Thank you. All right. So we have a, a motion you. and a second. Please call the roll. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Okay, we are now on uh, agenda item 7CC, which was pulled from um, the consent 6I, mm -hmm. and that's the um, amendment 2. Yes, I was just concerned in reading this. Uh, we're not only accepting a name change, but we're also authorizing an increase in hourly fees. Is this something that's in the contract? That's uh, something they can do without our... They cannot do it without our uh, express approval via this amendment that's before the commission for consideration. So how, I didn't get to go into it, how long have we had the contract with them? Uh, we entered into these agreements in 2018. So this is a three year with a two year extension or, and I'm just concerned that I didn't see any explanation as to why they were so I in, so I, I, requesting an if increase. If I may, I could, I could recognize the acting purchasing director, Mrs. Elise Treisman. She can p potentially answer those questions for you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Con Commissioners. Elise Treisman, acting purchasing director. So before you um, is a request to approve uh, the name change and authorize an increase in hourly fees. The agreements, was, the agreements were authorized by the commission in 2017 and further amended in 2018. And in the First Amendment, uh, there was a clause that allowed the firms to request a price adjustment consistent with the Consumer Price Index. Um, so before you is the request. We've not approved a previous request, and the request is in the amount of 3%. Ask a question. Sure. It seems very reasonable when you look at the various categories in the increase. But the three times multiplier, is that typical? That's not changing, correct? That is not changing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Okay, moving on to Thank 7B, you. ratification of emergency <coughs> regulations. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Mayor Petrolia? Yes. yes. Sorry. Okay, yes. moving on to 7C, which is the nomination for appointments for the Public Art um, Advisory Board. We start off with uh, Commissioner <coughs> Cassell. Fabulous. Thank you. I would like to nominate Max Zengage. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Congratulations, Max. Um, okay, moving on to uh, uh, Commissioner Boylston. You took mine, but I'm still going <laughs> to say nice things about you, Max. A young entrepreneur who's uh, going to school here locally to be in urban planning, I believe. I could be right. Yeah, I yeah. am right. Nope, that's right. it. So thank you. Um, now I'm stuck with this one. I hope this is, e I'm even close. <laughs> um, and I say that only because of it's, it's hard to pronounce. Asula. Vasilia? Second. Hoping. Okay, any comments? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. And here we go to Vice Mayor. Yes, I had a list and I left it at home, but I'm thinking I wrote down, uh, don't have the first name, um, Ms. Mamoni? Mamoni? Okay. Second. Okay, any discussion? None. Call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Okay, moving on to nomination for Downtown Development Authority, and this would be for Commissioner Bolston. I gave this uh, a, a lot of thought, and I think it's really important that we have some consistency um, on the Downtown Development Authority Board. So I'm going to be reappointing uh, Mr. Alan Costello. Second. He's, I think he's not. Okay. Any comments? I'm sorry? I don't think he's eligible. Yes. He is. Oh. They don't have term limits on the DBA. Okay. I thought I read that, so I okay. guess my so, information um, is incorrect. If, if it comes out that way, we'll have them reappoint or re-select. Okay. Re Very good. All right, so we have a, a motion and a second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. 
Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Moving on to the green implementation advice. I think I had one. Please. Advancement board, huh? I think I had one. Too. Oh, did you have one? I'm I sorry. Think so. I don't. Am I wrong? I only saw one. Only one? No, okay. there was only one. Okay. I think I should prepare in case you didn't. I apologize. <laughs> I okay, apologize. so um, <laughs> the Please Green speak. Implementation Advancement Board, and this starts off with Commissioner Casal again. Yes, uh, I would like to nominate Nancy Channon. Second. Mm -hmm. okay. Any fine. discussion? No. Hearing none. Call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. And moving uh, for the second regular um, uh, board member, Mr. Bolston. I would like to reappoint Ms. Sarah Lucas. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. And there are two alternates, starting with Deputy Vice, I mean, Deputy, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Johnson. I'm going to pass. They chose mine. I'm going to do okay, that. Okay, you want to do it the next time around? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the final one would be an alternate that I'm going to cho choose, and I am going to go with a Suzanne Donahue. Second. Okay. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Mr. Bolson. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Okay, now we're moving on to the Housing Authority. We have one appointment, and that would be with uh, Ms. Cassell. Yes, thank you. I would like to appoint uh, Robert Townsend. Second. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, call the roll. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Okay, and here we go for the Education Board. Get May ready. Can I stop <laughs> for a moment on this? I have a question. I apologize. On uh, the Education Board you're talking yes, about? Yes, that's correct. Yes. On the agenda cover report, uh, Kateri, it says that um, Karen Sipperstein um, is, has only served one term and would like to be appointed for a second, but I don't think I see her name on that list. There. Well, are you yeah. picking before me? Because if you're picking before no, no. me, she's off the list. But if you no, no, no I'm not. I will. I, no, I won't take she's her. But not on the list. no, I don't see her name on the list. But she's um, on the agenda cover report. Right, she and is so absolutely. Because I was just wondering if that was a glitch. No, I would have to check on that. I should, do apologize. Should we put Can this we, vote off for a week? Yes. Or excuse me, until the August meeting. Okay. Yes. So the whole nomination you're going to take. And, couldn't we do it in July? Couldn't yes. we do it in July? We have next yeah, week. no, we have, we have one we have more meeting next week. week. We can certainly roll it to that yes. next okay, meeting. So Sorry, you want to just disc okay. discard the whole thing and you'll figure it out? Yes. All right, very good. So we're going to move on that. and you. leave that. Th thank you for noticing that, uh, Commissioner. Um, moving on to 7H, which is nominations for the Kids and Cops Committee. And this is um, going to be, again, Commissioner Cassell. Ooh, you are like the top of the list uh, here. I would like to appoint Corey Cassidy. Second. Thank hey. you. Any any comments? None. All right. Call the roll, please. Okay. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Franco. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. And we have another appointment from uh, Commissioner Boylston. Yes. Chris Sherless. Second. Okay. Any comments? Seeing none. Call the roll. Mr. Franco. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes, and we're now at the Parking Management Advisory Board, and we have two um, spots, and we're going to start off with, uh, gee, Ms. Cassell again. What do you know? <laughs> She's I in a row. would like to appoint uh, Mr. Harvey Brown. Second. Okay, any comments? Seeing none, call the roll. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Surprise, surprise. Commissioner Bolston, you have the second pick. <laughs> Yes, and for the third time, I think Ms. Cassell took my first. I pick apologize. Did you? That's okay. I got. We're, we got we plenty of applicants. I'm going to reappoint Mr. Uh, Hallie Barton. Second. All right. Any any comments, concerns? None. Uh, call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Okay, and another big board of appointments. We have one appointment to serve through the year of 2022. That will be um, Commissioner Bolston. This is on the police. Correct? Yes, the police okay. advisory okay, board. Next one. Yes, Mr. Gary Rex. Second. Okay. Any comments? Yes. Seeing none. Call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Okay. Moving on to um, Vice Mayor. These are going to be the next uh, six, I believe, or five of them. Six um, are going to be 2023 mm -hmm. appointments. I'd like to move uh, Ms. Ann Stacy Wright. Second. Any comments? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. 
Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. And I was going to go with one person that's already been picked so uh, on a different board. So I am going to move to Boone as the, the name that I'm moving forward. Second. Okay, call the roll, please. Oh, any comments? Seeing none, call the roll. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. And Deputy Vice Mayor, you have the next pick. I'll move the name Carice. C H E R E L U S. I thought they. I. That was. Didn't point. you just point that? Sure that was, yeah. That was that was the one I was yeah. going to kids do. Kids and cops. That was kids and cops. So sorry. that's kids and cops. So, sorry. Yeah. So that's no good. No good. How about Suzanne Donahue? No, she was just appointed. She was yeah. appointed? <laughs> Why are all these people on my list? <laughs> well, because they're on both, or they're choosing two and three. You want to pass? Uh, how about Paige Wiggins? There you go. Wiggins. That's a, that's the name. <laughs> Any comments? It's at the end of the list. <laughs> Seeing none, call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. And we're moving on to uh, Commissioner Cassell. I think I will select um, Eric Feldmanis. Second. Thank what's you. the last name? I think it's Feldmanis. I may need new glasses. Feldman, I ask. Sorry? Feldmanis. 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 F-E-L-D-M-A-N-I-S. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got a, uh, any comments, concerns, inquiries, none. Call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. And we're back around to Commissioner Boylston. Good luck. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, um, I'll push mine until next meeting. And then finally to uh, the vice mayor again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass again. <laughs> okay, so we're going to have two on the next mm -hmm. one. And now we have moved on to public hearings um, and second readings. And this is acceptance of the resolution 105-21 stormwater utility assessment. A resolution of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, establishing a budget for the stormwater utility system, establishing rates for stormwater management assessments for each parcel within the benefited area, other than non-assessed property, providing for a public hearing, providing for the certification and adoption of the stormwater assessment rule in accordance with Chapter 56 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, and providing an effective date. And this is a public hearing. Okay, so Missy. Uh, good evening again, Mayor and Commissioners. Missy Barletto, Public Works Director. I'm here to present the annual stormwater utility assessment. Um, to set the rates that will appear on the tax bill and to have you accept the tax roll. Um, this is an annual event. The assessment is $5.33 per month for a total assessment of $63.96 per equivalent residential unit. So per home, the annual fee is about $63.96 that shows on your tax bill. For those residents inside the city limits that are also served either by the Lake Worth Drainage District or by a private drainage system, they receive a 25% discount on their rates. This rate that we're, we're bringing before you this year has not changed in several years. This is the same rate. We are, um, as we've discussed with Commission in the past, we are moving forward with doing a utility rate study that will will look at how to structure the rates to, to start helping to finance the, the significant stormwater improvements that we need to make in the city in years gone by. That rate study has been advertised and is in the selection process now. So this particular assessment will bring in $2,173,726. And there are some pennies that I left off the the uh, presentation. Um, the expenses that this fund covers include the administration of the facilities and salaries for stormwater specific staff, um, operating expenses in our stormwater program and capital outlay that is used to improve our stormwater system. Some of the capital projects that may be um, that may potentially be funded out of this um, fund in the coming year include construction of the Thomas Street pump station 
and you're smiling at I'm me, smiling. and you know why. Um, the Tropic Isle neighborhood improvements, Cash Arena and Bucita seawall repairs um, that have been a long ongoing. And in this coming year, we are also proposing to do a stormwater education campaign that uh, we are hoping you'll approve and that will will include a call to artists to do some very creative stormwater um, activities in the in the um, rights of way of our city in the downtown area and with that i'll open it up for any questions you might have okay well first we've got public comments so we want to oh. open it up to the public if there's anybody in the public that would like to speak to um, item agenda item 8a which is resolution 105-21. Please step forward, state your name and address, and you would have three minutes. Seeing nobody moving from their seats, I'm gonna close for the public comments and bring it back to the commission for discussion. Yes, ma'am. May I ask one question? Um, you say rates unchanged from prior years. How many do you know, Missy? I, it's been, I've been here five years. It's never changed in that time, changed. and I don't believe it changed in very many of the years prior to that. Okay. I, I have a question, ma'am. We've had this program for more than five years. I don't know, and again, I don't see anything that talks about what we've done for the past at least five years. Um, it would be nice if we knew if we've been getting two million dollars on an average, maybe a little less, as it's grown, of course, right? It's has it remained mm -hmm. this amount of money it's for five remained years? exactly almost exactly in this particular in this um, same amount, very close for many years. And it would be nice when these things are presented to us if we could get a little background because five times two, at least $10 million, where has it gone? And not to say this didn't happen, this didn't happen, that's what I'm looking for. What did we do with that money? Um, I'd like to also have some uh, little numbers put next to those sample capital projects. When we, when we bring the, the budget forward, when we bring the, the CIP budget forward to you and the regular budget, you'll see those numbers. Um, and in the attachment to this agenda item for tonight, you'll see all of those numbers outlined. Um, the amount of stormwater activities that we need for, for paying for salaries and operations and that sort of thing in the coming year is nearly $4 million. So you'll find things in Sorry, the would you repeat that? Is, is nearly four million dollars. It's nearly four million dollars. The amount of projects that we need to do, the amount of staff that needs to be funded, those kinds of things coming in the in the coming year. If we were able to fund everything on our list, we would be well beyond this amount of money, which we will not be able to fund everything on our list. Very good. How many people are working on just the stormwater, or do you get a portion of 10 people's time, since I don't have numbers. I know you're going to show it to me later. It would be nice to have something <laughs> no, here. No, I'm happy to have this conversation with you now. Um, the stormwater program, when Environmental Services Department used to be including both the Utilities Department and the Public Works Department, when those two departments were split, the stormwater program was kind of split as well. So there are there are some folks in the in the utilities department in the wastewater division that are helping the public works department by doing stormwater pump um, maintenance and taking care of, of our pumping stations. As we look to start increasing the number of pumping stations that are required to continue the level of service for the stormwater program into the future, we need to bring those those salaries back into the Public Works Department and create a, a division. Right now we have a stormwater engineer that is 100% dedicated to stormwater issues. <coughs> we have a stormwater administrator that, spent, that um, does a lot of our reporting requirements with, um, we have an NPDES permit 
with the federal government. The, we have reporting requirements that are, that are associated with that. Um, she takes the, the regular calls and, and formulates those and works with our stormwater maintenance crews that, that go out and do things like um, digging swales, clearing storm drains before a storm. The street sweeper program is what part. You, I'm sorry, what did you call that person? What was the title? The, the one that cleans the swales. Well, their, their actual title right now is streets maintenance worker, but they are assigned specifically to a stormwater crew, and they are paid for out of this budget. So you have, you perhaps have crews, okay, this probably should be something I'll take offline. So okay. I can understand it. What I can do, um, Vice Mayor, if, if, if you like, as we set up our budget one-on-ones with the, each commissioner, I'll make sure that when we prepare the worksheets that we thoroughly brief you on the stormwater fund and it's in, in, in different it's uses because some of it will be operating like Missy says and some of it will be presented in the capital improvement program as well yes I'm happy to say do that thing about pumping stations I don't think we discussed pumping stations at the goal setting at all unless that was in the water treatment yeah. I don't know I, I don't, don't know that that's actually going to be in the next year's budget but I mean that's something that we're actually having to we're going to have to be doing this is there's a lot of water standing around. It's not because of the fact that the it's it's because our so this is something that drainage we is have, changing. We should have discussed it during the goal setting. At least a well, we kind minor of did. discussion. We, yeah, no, we kind of did, but it's 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 the the table of the, the water table is rising, and as a result of that, the old way of of draining off water is no longer working as it used to. Perhaps we need a uh, workshop on this. Well, perhaps. <laughs> oh, look at me. All right, so um, any other questions? I, I have one for you. Um, do we handle any other um, cities uh, stormwaters, any other municipality stormwater? No, ma'am. Okay, that's all I had. Motion so to, oh, I'm sorry. No, what'd you say, I'm sorry, what? Somebody, uh, I was gonna say, wouldn't we have something that uh, would be a part of Highland Beach? Uh, don't we, we, they are a part of well, our that's system. A, their stormwater, specifically their stormwater, doesn't come our way. We don't deal with their We storm deal water. with their wastewater. Reclaimed. Just the wastewater, which right. doesn't go Ocean into the stormwater. Motion to approve. Do Second. To? Should I go? <laughs> Resolution 105-21. Second. <laughs> second. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other comments? Call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boston. Yes. Okay, so now we are at 8B, which is also a public hearing, Thank and you, it coordinates, I believe, with C and D, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? It does. So okay. 8, 8B, 8C, and 8D are one of three all together. So is it okay if I read them all and then yes, we'll just do please. the public hearing for it? Perfect. Ordinance number 18-21. Sorry. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, adopting a land use map amendment redesignating the future land use for 39.42 acres of land from general commercial GC in part and transitional TRN in part to commercial core CC, pursuant to section 163.3187 Florida statutes for properties generally located within the area bounded on the north so on the north by Southeast 4th Street, on the south by Southeast 10th Street, on the east by th Southeast 7th Avenue, and on the west by the alley between Southeast 4th Avenue and Southeast 5th Avenue, all of which are adjacent to either Southeast 5th Avenue or Southeast 6th Avenue, as more particularly described herein, providing a conflicts clause and a severability clause, providing an effective date, and for other purposes. Ordinance number 19-21, an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, rezoning land presently zoned general commercial GC in part, neighborhood commercial NC in part, and professional office district POD in part, to central business district CBD, said land containing approximately 39.42 acres, and generally located within the area bounded on the north by Southeast 4th Street, and the south by Southeast 10th Street, on the east by Southeast 7th, Sorry, 7th Avenue, and on the west by the alley between Southeast 4th Avenue and Southeast 5th Avenue, all of which are adjacent to either Southeast 5th Avenue or Southeast 6th Avenue, is more particularly described herein. Amending the City of Delray Beach zoning map, May 4, 2021, providing a complex clause, a severability clause, providing an effective date, and for other purposes. 
Ordinance number 20-21, Ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Delray Beach by amending Chapter 4, Zoning Regulations, Article 4.4, Base Zoning District, Section 4.4.13, Central Business District, CBD, Subsection A, Purpose and Intent, Subsection B, Regulating Plans, Subsection C, Allowable Uses, Subsection D, Configuration Buildings, Subsection E, Frontage Standards, Subsection F, Architectural Standards, Subsection G, Civic Open Spaces, Subsection H, Incentive Program, Subsection I, CBD Parking Standards, Subsection H, Incentive Program, Subsection I, CBD Parking Standards, and Subsection K, CBD Review and Approval Process to create a CBD subdistrict, include regulations specific to the new subdistrict, including but not limited to allowable uses, parking, building configuration, frontage standards, architectural standards, civic open spaces, providing for new figures and redesignation of other tables or figures, and additional clarifications of existing regulations, providing conflicts clause, severability clause, authority to codify, providing an effective date, and for other purposes. What a, what a, <coughs> what a, what a lot. Thank you. Just, 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 just. So at this point, this would be- You can idea. open it up to public hearing. I'm sorry? You can open it up to public hearing. Okay. This is first reading. Oh, I'm sorry. So that's correct. Rules, it's we don't first do reading. I forgot. Today. So at this point in time, the only thing I do want to put on the record is just to be really clear that yes. because this process was right. interrupted due to the pandemic, correct. there is a shift in ordinance numbers from what went to the planning board, and they're on the screen before you. Um, and so just just for an abundance of caution, um, 04 20 turned into 18 21. Uh, 0520 turned into 1921 and 0620 turned into 2021. They did go to planning board under their original ordinance numbers. And in addition to that, we have already heard this before. However, the issue is that we're doing it on a first read again because of the interruption. Correct. Therefore, our first reads are a little bit different um, this year in that we just agree to move forward with them or not. Right. But anybody can speak to this. Um, if there's anybody here who would like to speak to um, uh, agenda item 8B, C, or D, you can please step forward and state your comments. Uh, just make sure you state your name and address, and uh, you got three minutes. James Quillian, 925 Southeast 2nd Avenue. Um, I beg to differ. This wasn't just canceled or slowed down because of COVID. This was slowed down because the neighborhood came out in force and was very much opposed to this. Uh, and the process in which it was uh, brought brought about. Um, I understand that, you know, there's maybe a commissioner or two that or were um, encouraged by their donors to push this on to um, our neighborhood and to look to rezone an area that is not blighted, that isn't in need of rezoning, to be rezoned. There are plenty of areas in this city that need to be rezoned, that need uh, the blight to be swept away, but this particular area doesn't have that problem. So why would um, city staff be uh, directed to make it easier for a developer to build large scale buildings? When they can already do that, it just costs more money and it's harder. So why would they go about the process of making it easier for them? It goes against everything that every commissioner sits up there, says to all their constituents every time they get a chance. We're for controlling growth in Del Rey. We're for making meaningful growth when it does happen. To me, this seems like uh, the exact opposite of that, that that you have two two sides of Federal Highway, both with residential, one where the uh, where they get special privileges, special roads paid for by the city that are private. The other side, we don't get that. You know, Osceola Park, we don't have those same privileges. Uh, the intensity of development that would happen to our side is different than it would be to the east side, and then in the middle where Carl DeSantis owns all the property. I guess it's time for him to get all the redevelopment that he wants in the middle and build Del Rey as high as he can to the sky, you know, because that's what he wanted to do on a Del Rey Commons over there. And that didn't really turn out too well over, you know, an ensuing 12 year battle to build it. So, you know, once again, this isn't what the neighborhood wants. And, you know, we thought that tonight would be more along the lines of an information thing of, of coming back to the neighbors getting their input and designing what the neighbors could live with or wanted, not an actual voting on it and pushing it through and passing it through. The neighborhood as a whole, the, the people that do understand it don't like it, and then there's still people that don't even understand what's going on. Um, and there's been, since the last time you guys directed the city staff or you put this on hold, there's been zero input 
with the neighborhood. Zero outreach to the neighborhood about anything. Now, I know on the other side of uh, Federal Highway, I'm sure they have their own private meetings and all kinds of input, but we don't get that in Osceola Park. And it's not because they don't know who the contact person is. Everybody sitting up there knows who the contact person is. My wife. <laughs> and then, then we can get the neighborhood together, right? <laughs> right? And so it's pretty easy. I mean, they can't say that they don't want to talk to me because I'm abrasive and aggressive and scary. They can always call my wife. Thank you. Is she here? She did. Yeah. herself? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm Jim Chard, uh, a proud resident of Osceola Park at 401 Southeast 4th Avenue. And uh, quite often my good friend Jim and I, even though we share the same name in the same neighborhood, uh, have different points of views on things. And uh, his wife and I and a couple of other people from the neighborhood were involved in this uh, about six years ago. Uh, we presented a community-based master plan for Osceola Park. And that was incorporated in a lot of the work that the Missy and Public Works and Planning uh, have done as they have moved forward in improving our neighborhood. If any of you have had the uh, opportunity to drive through the neighborhood in the last couple of weeks, you'll find out how challenging that is. But the key thing is that uh, this was a community-driven plan. And I'd just like to do, uh, give you a couple quotes from it. Uh, this was all pulled together, is presented to the community. Uh, we met at the uh, old VFW building, it's now Granger's. And uh, first objective of the master plan was maintain primarily residential character integrated with emerging commercial and multifamily residential. That was the first objective. And then general recommendation, extend the CBD to Southeast 10th on Federal. And another one is accessibility, improve connectivity between residential and commercial retail areas off Federal Highway. This is a blighted area. I am not quite sure uh, what Jim is referring to. That area of the, between the two streets from 4th to 10th, between 5th and 6th, has been blighted for at least 20 years. Uh, when you drive down there, you see just empty lots, right in the middle of our city. It could very well be where our city grows forward, where it takes the development pressure off of Atlantic Avenue, takes advantage of the $16 million or so that we spent in redesigning, improving, and making safe and uh, more attractive federal, and also allows us to put affordable housing in the middle of our town, where people can walk to work, bike to work, uh, and live, work, play. This is the quintessential opportunity for live, work, play in Delray. And I think the amount of work that's gone into this over a period of 10 years, uh, I'm not sure exactly when uh, Dana started the work at Treasure Coast, but it, it's, it's up there in four, four or five years. And I also have to disagree with Jim. This has been brought before the community at least twice in public meetings. And I'm sure you remember, the Mayor, you were there. We had some lively discussions, as we always do in Delray, I mean in Osceola Park. Uh, we're a very mixed neighborhood with very mixed views. And I think this is not a perfect plan, but it's a start. We've been waiting for years to do something about that area. And it will be changed going forward. But if we send it back to the drawing board, so to speak, it'll be another X number of years. I don't think we should wait any longer to get something that is a goal for the city. Okay. And one last thing, if I may. Right now, under general commercial, somebody can go in there, whether it's Carl DeSantis or anybody else, and put whatever they want in, basically including a parking garage. Under this plan, what we get is well-designed, well-thought-through buildings that have density in the middle but t uh, filter off into the neighborhoods and the one-story single-family homes. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Lisa Collian, 925 Southeast 2nd Avenue. I am a little out of character tonight because I am angry. <laughs> 
Uh, first of all, we're here a year later after the same, and the, with the same exact thing in front of us, after the board clearly asked for two recommendations that were very clear. One was to change the linear effect and put the public in the or the public uh, space in the middle, and the other was can't we do something about bringing back away from that Osceola Park alley? You said it. There was two commissioners that sat up there and said, "Let's do that." Even the lawyer said, "You know, it sounds like there's not a lot talked about this. Maybe we need to have more workshops." So, I don't know how that didn't happen. That's frustrating. But the biggest thing is. Jim just said, we've been waiting for years for this. Who is we? Who brought this up to begin with to say, hey, commissioners, can somebody bring it up that this whole area isn't built up and huge yet? Who's saying that? There's development that almost happened, a nice little mall with a chocolate factory, one story with parking from the sides, not intruding in our alleys, that was about to happen. And suddenly, the developers thought, you know what, we might be able to convince the city to change the zoning, so let's do that. And now that project stopped. And no wonder we don't have building there, because it always feels like we can change the zoning. It always feels like we can go and beg for more. We is developers that would like to build and make more money. That's really the idea of those, uh, I guess, when, when both things were said, hey, can't we go back and help the Osceola Park Alley? Uh, the staff got up and said, well, we really can't because then we're taking away what the developers already have, right? So we, we understand that we don't want to take away what they're already guaranteed by what GC is now. The idea is we don't need to take anything away, but we also don't need to hand things to them. So if there was some reason that the city said, I think we could make this beautiful area, let's do something for that reason, I think we would have heard about it a lot sooner, rather than who knows where this came from, why it was brought up, and suddenly here we are bowing to the developers to try and get them more money and try to help them build as big and as but you know, whatever they can, meanwhile, we, we aren't making, you know, we can't step back and take away what they already have. So leave them with their GC that they bought, they own, they know what they have, so that we're not in any kind of liability for what we're taking away, because really, if they're going to build, Osceola Park knows that that's what they were going to build to begin with. So we don't need to hand them anything and forget about taking it away. So. Thank you. Sure. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Bill Morris. Uh, my address is 777 East Atlantic uh, here in Delray Beach. And I want to make a, a few comments here that, first of all, I think the driving force here uh, has been workforce housing. Uh, it is not for developers to make more money. It's a way, I think, for us, hopefully, and I am a developer, uh, I, I, I do own a project called Worthing Place that's 93 units an acre. Um, three times denser than any of the de density that's allowed. And, and personally, I don't think it intrudes too much uh, on the downtown area. But, uh, but I, I really think we, we have a situation here where we've, we've got those blocks that are open. Uh, I can tell you uh, honestly that it's, it is really a, an opportunity, I think, for people to mix what I call market rate housing with workforce housing. It's an area that I think that we can we can uh, develop. There's there's large uh, open lots, as you know. There, something's going to have to happen with that old B of A building, and maybe we can figure out some way. But uh, and I, and I don't personally have any property there. I, I do have a a great relationship with uh, Carl DeSantis, who is one of the most decent, wonderful man men in this uh, this county and this city. Uh, that's for sure. So he's, and he certainly doesn't need to build out and make any kind of crazy money. That's not the real world for him at all. He cares about Delray Beach, uh, as I do uh, deeply. And, and so I, I think you've got, you know, there's the, uh, the zoning was changed on the north side. Uh, you've got terrible uh, fractured ownership there that I don't think it ever worked there. It would work here. 
I can tell you for, from my personal perspective, uh, the garages will be uh, hidden better. I think Dana Little and his crew have done a terrific job. I, I personally think it's incredibly modest. I mean, if you really look at the realities, what you can do with uh, GC uh, zoning versus CBD, it, it's remarkably the same. Now, I do have a couple of specific comments. I really think that the parking requirement uh, at, uh, for one, uh, one bedroom at 125 should be 120. I think the uh, two bedroom should be 150. Uh, we had a study done uh, at Worthing Place for two seven day periods of time uh, two years ago in the busy season. We have 60% of our units are twos, uh, uh, and our, we have 217 units. Our actual usage, and uh, Adam Kerr, who did the, all the design work, did, did the work 24 7 for us. Uh, our actual uh, usage of our garage is 1.25. Uh, per, uh, per units, and we have again 60% two bedrooms, eight three bedrooms there. So, in any event, I, I would really urge you this is really, as Jim Shard said, this is a start. It, it really isn't as much as I had hoped, uh, but in any event, I just very much think that this is the right do, thing to do, and it really is a good start. And, and all due respect, I, I, I care about those neighbors, but I think this is, this is really a way to get started. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello, my name is Ken Ropp. I live at 217 Southeast Third Avenue in Delray Beach here. Um, my, my, uh, my concerns would be <clears throat> for my neighbors on Southeast Fourth Ave and uh, how this would affect them on the back side of their alley, uh, you know, how much more traffic is going to be behind their properties. If you uh, raise the density from 10 units to 22 units an acre, uh, you know, what, what's the parking going to look like? What's the access and the traffic in the alleys? Where are they going to go into these buildings? Uh, is it all going to be alley or what? Um, another thing is that, you know, adding residential units to this corridor is, is to me concerning. Uh, Delray really only has the uh, four lane north south access as Federal Highway. Boca has Dixie Highway as an alternative uh, to Federal, and Boynton has Seacrest, which is four lanes. Delray doesn't really have any other alternative four-lane highways. And to put residents here and add uh, extra density, uh, to me, that, that's, that's kind of concerning since it is our only uh, north-south access through the city. It already seems to be, you know, kind of backing up. We still haven't had... Uh, the, you know, the completion of uh, some of the bigger projects around 7th Ave and, um, you know, uh, we already get backups uh, on Federal Highway as it is. But that would be one of my other concerns. And um, the, uh, I wonder, have, you know, to add all this uh, extra um, units and is, has there been has there been a study done of, of the impact that it would have if, you know, you, you add all this new units and, and density? Uh, has there been a, a study on the traffic, on parking, and on pedestrian uh, safety? Um, that would be my main concerns. I would like you to see that uh, maybe set this back a little and, and, and talk about it more uh, to our neighbors on Southeast 4th Ave and see where, where they feel with it. Um, but uh, basically, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Gary Wolf. I'm at 831 Southeast 4th Avenue. And uh, one thing no one's mentioned on this whole thing is that uh, the 800 block, there's, um, there's no alleyway. There's a 16-foot alleyway in the 400, the 500, the 600, the 700, and the 900, but not in the 800. We do, however, have a dog kennel that doesn't belong there. So you guys, I told this to you a month ago, I told the judge, I told you that the judge said that it shouldn't be going on. And you guys are over there rolling your eyes and laughing and your attorney knows that the judge told the Delray attorney and the judge told the Delray code guy and you guys are sitting here stroking it and What's going on? You guys can't even run a damn lemonade stand. The judge, you know, you went to a judge when he's on your side because somebody's 11 days late. This thing's been going on for two years. 
And you're like, oh, ho, hum, we'll get to it one day. Uh, you know, what the fuck? What's going on? You guys want to? You guys want to control six blocks along Federal Highway along the main part of town, and you can't even you can't even take care of one damn dog kennel that's barking 24/7. And the judge already told you. You know what the hell? Do you blame these people? Do you blame these people? I think we're done. Yeah. He's in violation of our local rules. I, I think. Yeah, because you guys suck. Have a good day. You guys suck. That's the problem. I'm not the problem. You're the problem. Anyone else? Anyone like to follow? No one? <laughs> Anything? Anyone? I'm going to close otherwise. Close the comments. Public comments closed. Um, okay, so I'm sorry. I just got it. Okay, so um, at this point, we're going to make a decision. I believe to move forward or not. Do you want to? Do you want to say something? So, Anthea, if you want Anthea to clarify some of the comments, um, you know, I, I think a lot of the or a lot of the content of the ordinance addresses some of the concerns. We move this. To, we brought this forward to you. Number one, because of the time lapse. And number two, for you to decide if this is something that the commission wants to move forward. You can move it forward, direct a workshop, or you know, you can move it in any fashion that you want. Um, but we had to get it back on an agenda right. somehow for you to consider it. That's why it's back in this fashion. Right. May I ask a question? Sure. We can't hear you. Oh, I apologize. Excuse me. And I'm sorry. I, you know, I've been rushing the meeting along because I forgot the new rules about first readings, that there's not a whole presentation. but. This is a question. Um, who did initiate this? Wasn't this initiated by the city? Yeah, so um, before you were a sitting commissioner, this was um, an effort that was directed by the city commission um, with an effort to sort of, I think, anticipating that the next sort of wave of development we might expect would be coming down this corridor and to be proactive in ensuring we had a higher level of design criteria and that we could get in front of that potential wave before we had people asking for like seven story buildings and 70 DUs per acre or something really insanely different than what we had before. Mm -hmm. So this has been a long time coming. It was also part considered as part of the Osceola Park um, redevelopment plan that it worked in partnership with that. They shared a couple of public meetings with Treasure Coast. And actually, um, Ms. Casal, you were on the planning board when these older ordinances came through, and if you recall, it was a pretty packed house. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the highest attended, I think, meetings that we've had, and it did receive a, recommend, a unanimous recommendation of approval from the board at that time. So this has been out there. We have had a, a pretty significant gap. So at this point, however you want to proceed, our consultants are ready to assist. We can answer questions today. We can go to workshop. We can come back. Um, because there's a pretty significant land use change, this is a transmittal hearing for the future land use change, so it goes to the state um, for review, and a second reading wouldn't be for another month or so. So I, I don't know how much you want me to address now. It is weird with the new local rules. <laughs> so, it's in October, right? It's not going to be until October. We, mm -hmm. we hear it would this. probably, yes, it would probably come back. More than a month. I, I, we, I'd really like to see uh, public workshops, public outreach. I agree. You're I agree. not going to address Thank it tonight. You. It doesn't have a big yeah. enough audience tonight. Okay. Um, it, I, I think that's absolutely necessary in between first and second. In between, so, okay. So, we still have to vote. Yeah. Because we I can mean, definitely well, address we the LDRs. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's a good idea. And I, and I think that, you know, there's just been so much time that's lapsed that there's a totally lot of agree. people who do not know really what's going on and can't recall. And I, mm -hmm. I think that when we were finishing it, if I remember the first read last time, there was a, a meeting of, I thought, most of the communities and the mines, but mm -hmm. I feel that there may not be that right now. And so we might want to just go back and readdress and see where Absolutely. we can get No, we're, we're here. We just couldn't figure out how to revive it yeah. and get it back on everyone's radar. I think the best thing is to do is, to do is just address the misinformation. I'm not saying open back up. I know there's hundreds mm -hmm. of hours right. and years put into this plan and a lot of inputs, by the way. Right. Some of the things that was pointed out about it's different here, it's different here. Well, it didn't start that way, you know, but yeah. input from the community is why it's custom here and custom here. And uh, no, this isn't a plan to build as high as they want or right. anything or huge or these words I'm hearing. Now till then, 
we need to make sure that there's no misinformation out there and right. that everyone understands the plan moving forward and why we're doing that. And it, it's a shift from consumer and shopping centers and empty and empty storefronts and rental car, you know, um, plazas to residential. Right. Right. To right. like you said, improving the design criteria. Right. And being and actually proactive about it. And, and recognizing the corridor is different than downtown. Um, the parking requirements are slightly higher, um, and we were reluctant to lower them because we don't want the overflow to right. go into the neighborhood. So it is a little bit different. Has been extremely customized. <laughs> they they yeah. the, the conditions are are wildly different in this small area. So um, I so I don't know. Do I address or do we just table it to workshop? I think, I think we, we table it for a workshop. Yeah. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Or, Dedicated workshop. Or do we move it forward on first it? reading and I send it to DEO? How yeah, do you guys I'll, want to do this? I'll make that motion. <laughs> okay. What's that? I'll make the motion to pass the first reading and we'll have a workshop Second on it. Second that motion. So it's a motion to approve ordinance. We have 18. to do each one separately. Yes. Motion to approve ordinance. But wait a second. If we're going. twenty one. All right. Make me need a second. I thought you just said we were going to table it. We need no, a she's need a second approving. First. Oh, we have to approving approve first it. reading because there is a second reading. And that second reading is October. We so. need a second first before we can continue. Yeah, to go second. do a second. Excuse okay. me. Thank Thank you. You. For, for open for discussion now. In order right. to move this forward, we, yeah. we need to do what Commissioner Boylston is suggesting. We approve right. it on first reading. Yeah. We'll do the public workshop right. and, and you know um, the informational session, and then we'll have second reading and whatever discussions come out of that workshop will be incorporated into this, right, this which is second reading very That's, close to our standard procedure today yes. which we're about okay to and so you know just so everybody understands this is moving it forward because I don't think that you're going to be going backwards and so from my perspective am I not correct well we spent hundreds of dollars on advertising this because it's such a big change yeah. so to defer it would really be um, in effect inefficient <laughs> so I think we approve the first reading no nothing is going to be codified at this point so we just we'll hold it we'll send it to the state like we need to we will hold our workshop in, in between first and second reading there's no timeline on second uh, setting the second reading okay so as long as you know we don't wait another year we're good and then we, after the workshop, after we receive your comments, the public comments, and more direction, then we'll hold the second reading. Okay, and so if it's not acceptable at second reading, we can say no to it and it, and it dies. Of course. Or you can make changes to it. You can hold another second reading. There's a lot of options that you have. Okay. So yes, but nothing is being put into place as a result of moving it to second reading. Can someone clarify why it's, why it's going to the state? Because of the size. The land use changes. Anytime we change the land use, um, it goes to the state. If it's a small amount, it's sort of a, like, it's, they don't, I don't even think they look that hard at them, but this is a larger area, and so the state about has the how, opportunity to, um, you know, look at the, About how large acreage, if you can just... 40 39.42 acres. Yeah. I'm sorry? 39.42 acres? It's 30, yeah. It's, it's just over 39 acres of land. So there are certain thresholds within this Florida statutes where things either go through an expedited review, which is almost like a rubber stamp, and then there's one where it's a little bit more, more rigorous, and so that's what this one has to do. And then the state has a timeline to provide comments. Does, has the state historically ever said no? I think at this point, I mean, the areas of growth management have been pretty wildly differing depending on our leadership. Um, right now, I think the largest concerns are related to the coastal communities that are within the coastal high hazard areas and um, ultimately, you know, climate change, change effects and things like that. So I don't know that, I mean, also understanding that the FAR is very similar between the two. This isn't a significant change where like single family is being rezoned to you know, high-rise office or something like that. So this isn't, they're, they're fairly similar land use. So there have been some changes since this was started, and I heard someone say it's been 10 years. Do we know how long this has been back and forth, back and forth? We're going to workshop this. I know. Well, I've only worked here four, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but, um, but right, so, so there is a history. I mean, this, the, one of the strong parts about our city is that we do do neighborhood planning pretty seriously, and so um, it, it is good when we have the community that has um, that history and we have those, um, those neighborhood plans that are updated like Osceola's recently was. Um, I'm, I'm just a little concerned, not concerned, mm -hmm. but interested, curious. 
why do we not ever have someone on the east side of this project? But unless I'm missing it, I've I always hear someone from Osceola Park. We're gonna make them so wave at you now. Here, speak up. I'm sorry. I did. I'd just like to hear the other side. You're opening public comment. I, you know, I, I would didn't. Is that what's happening? Is that your discretion? Possible? I mean, I mean, we public can, comments. Closed. Do we want to open it back up, or do we just sure, go ahead I'll, and allow them to talk? I would open it back up. I okay, so just one. Yeah. All right, opening public comment back up. Say your name, address. Robert Sparks, 839 Southeast 7th Avenue. We live on the east side. Uh, we've had um, lots of meetings with the staff. They have listened to us. We have made suggestions. Some of them have been taken, some not. On the whole, we're pleased with the process. Um, we have no beef, however, if the commission decides they want to kick this down the road a bit to allow more input from the folks in Osceola, it's okay with us. So we are satisfied thus far. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. All right. Anyone else? Thank you, Mayor. Seeing no public comments, public comments closed once again. And so we have a first, I mean, I'm sorry, a motion and a uh, second on the floor for ordinance uh, number 18-21. Any other comments? I'd just like to know if we pass this tonight, how soon can we get a workshop? That, that's your call. We do have um, a very rough tentative agenda that we actually went through with staff last week. So, you know, it would pro potentially require shifting things. I believe we were looking at September for, we have the downtown, the noise ordinance. I mean, there's, there's a, a lot rush. of things that have there's a rush economic to, viability. There's a rush to do this, why? I mean, there's a rush? There's no there isn't, there isn't. There isn't. There isn't, so we don't have to have a workshop within the next no. four or six months. Well, I, I don't. I don't recommend waiting that long. Um, you know, because what happens is then we start forgetting about things, and then we wind up with the same situation we found ourselves with this one, where a year later we still haven't had second reading. And again, with the expense and time that's been spent on this, I really wouldn't recommend waiting. The most I would say is three months, and then you know get it back on for second. I just, reading. I'm just thinking we're in the midst of our budget. The land use has to be heard within 180 days okay. of first reading. So there is, I keep forgetting that it's tipped into that higher level, and I'm sorry I didn't prep you with that sooner. Okay, so we need to get it. We'll have it before October, October workshop, and then after, right after that, we'll bring it back for second. Okay. Okay. So it would be it's at just, least before Just very the concerned that we're in the middle of our, before. just very concerned that we're in the middle of our budget session. That'll be after. If we do it in October or, you know, or before, just depending on what what is available, you know, then, mm -hmm. then we won't let it interfere with our budget. Okay, so call the roll. <laughs> Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolster? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Need a motion for 19. Motion to approve ordinance 19-21. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Motion to approve ordinance 20-21. Yes, second. <laughs> Got Laurel, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Okay, and we have another first read ordinance. And, and before we go any further, if we could get a definitive um, date for the workshop, I'd appreciate it. We tend not to always follow. And that through. might be easy, because it should be on our calendars. If we're looking at the October, yeah. you're looking at... Um, October, probably the 12th. Yep, the 12th. October 12th is that's our workshop meeting yeah. in October. I think we should tentatively go ahead and push for that. Got it. And then we can always hear it um, the week, the, the, the final in, in October, the 1st of November. We probably do the second meeting in November only because of the notice requirements in case oh, we have changes. Mm -hmm. yep. Sounds great. Thank you. All right, moving on to um, agenda item 9A, which is ordinance 26-21. Ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Delray Beach by amending Chapter 4, Zoning Regulations, Article 4.4, Base Zoning District, Section 4.4.13, Central Business District, CBD, Subsection A, Purpose and Intent, Subsection B, Regulating Plans, Subsection C, Allowable Uses, Subsection D, Configuration Building. Subsection E, Frontage Standards. Subsection F, Architectural Standards. Subsection G, Civic Open Spaces. 
subsection I, CBD parking standards, and subsection K, CBD review and approval process to provide clarification of, ex of existing regulations, renumbering of figures, and amending the parking requirement for buildings on properties less than 65 feet wide and containing more than two stories, and providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and author authority to codify, providing an effective date, and for other purposes. And this is first reading as well. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Mr. Bolson. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Okay, moving on to um, 9B, ordinance number 16-21. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the Land Development Regulations of the City of Delray Beach Code of Ordinances by amending Chapter 2, Administrative Provisions, Article 2.4, General Procedures, Section 2.4.3, Submission Requirements, Subsection A, Standard Application Items, and Subsection B, Standard Plan, plan Items, to add required application items and make grammatical changes to plan items, Section 2.4.6, Procedures for Obtaining Permits and Approvals, Subsection B, Building Permits, to specify the Requirement for green building certification by amending Chapter 3, Performance Standards, Article 3.2, Performance Standards, sub Section 3.2.3, .3, Standards for Site Plan and or Plat Actions to require lead certification for new construction or additions over 5,000 square feet by amending Chapter 4, Zoning Regulations, Article 4.4, Base Zoning District, Section 4.4.13, Central Business CBD District, Subsection F, Architectural Standards to amend Urban Heat Island Requirements, in green building practices and refer to Article 7.11 for regulations by amending Chapter 7, Building Regulations, by enacting a new Article 7.11, Resilient Design and Construction Practices, to outline certification requirements for new private and public development, providing application pro procedures, bond requirements, and establishing a green building fund, a conflicts clause, a severability clause, authority to codify, and providing an effective date. And this too is first reading. Okay, and so again, um, because it's city, um, we're, we're still just approving or not approving. We're not doing presentation as my little section right. here says. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm just going to make a comment that I think that we, from my perspective, I want to move forward on this type of thing, but it might be a little bit aggressive. So I'm just going to say that in advance, but I'm going to push it forward because I think we need to have the conversation. Okay. Forward oh. to that conversation. Yep, you yep. got it. All right, so um, motion wanted? to approve ordinance 16 21. Second for first reading. Okay, call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boston. Yes. And before we move on to the comments and inquiries on uh, for the city manager and everyone else, um, I want to just uh, make a comment about these first reads we had a bunch of them in what in this which means that we're probably gonna have a bunch of second reads in the next and that's mm -hmm. going to be an extremely I mean this was a very thick uh, agenda but we really rolled through most of it once we got through that first part that was you know our own making um, so I'm just wanting to make sure that everybody's remaining remaining cognizant of the fact that each of these now being in the second read point could really take up a tremendous amount of time. So if there's a way of being able to somehow mm -hmm. kind of space it or kind of work with some first reads and second reads, I think that that might be smart. Just, just as a putting it out there. Don't so I, can, I can almost see what's going to happen yes. next. Yes. All right. Here. I want 10 second huh? readings. <laughs> Don't make plans next week. That's right, exactly. All right, so um, comments and inquiries on non-agenda items, city manager. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. I ha I just had um, two items. Um, a while back in last December, December 2020, we had applied for CARES Act funding from the county of over $615,000, to which I'm happy to finally apprise the commission that we have now received it. So I just wanted to let you know that we have received um, our CARES Act funding from Palm Beach County, $615,000. Great. And then my only second update is just... Um, to look over and keep all of our first responders safe as they um, head down to Surfside and assist. Thank you. Uh, may I yeah. jump in? Sure. Um, on that note, in regards to the CARES Act dollars, mm -hmm. um, there's a number that was out there that we're getting $13 million, and now those are, um, that's a different, has, that's um, different. I know it's different. I know it's oh, different. Oh, certainly. But just so on that it's note, in our meeting on Friday, you had mentioned that the 10. proper calculation had been it's done. 10. It's now 10. If you could just yeah, no problem. That just so everyone understands. 
Certainly, the American Rescue Plan Act, often referred to as ARPA, <laughs> um, when we had first been notified that it was passed um, by the federal government, we were notified that our estimate was $13.2 million to be um, supplied to the city half and half, half in this year of um, this month, and then half next year. Um, the new calculations, though, however, um, have it at $10.9 million. So as we proceed, um, with our budget discussions, in, including starting with next week, we have our first budget workshop. Um, we will be discussing with the commission how we intend to proceed and taking some feedback from the commission in terms of that. So it would be half, it would be, you know, almost six million this year, which we have actually received, we have applied for and received, and then the second half would be in next fiscal year. And that's the final calculation. Correct. Thank you. All right, anything else? Very good. City Attorney. Good evening. I had emailed you earlier at the start of the meeting um, some correspondence from our outside counsel who's handling our opioid litigation. Um, just briefly, I need a motion um, and an authorization to accept what's called the, um, the bankruptcy plan. So Purdue Pharma filed for bankruptcy back in September 2019. Um, as part of their bankruptcy proceedings, they have a restructuring plan that requires approval from any creditors um, of which the city is, is considered a creditor, a public creditor. So any creditors who had filed a proof of claim against the bankruptcy estate are being asked to vote on this proposed restructuring plan. Essentially, any assets that are in the Purdue Corporation will be transferred to a new corporation as part of the restructuring, and um, those monies will be dispersed to state, local governments, um, private creditors, um, plaintiffs in personal injury lawsuits, and things like that. Um, the assets of the bankruptcy estate will be used to pay these, these groups and private civic organizations, and any residual amount would be allocated to um, state, local, and tribal governments. The mayor actually participated in a call with our outside council where we discussed um, the allocation amounts, um, and I'll discuss that in just a moment. So. The funds are going to be restricted. Um, I think I've made you all aware of this. Any funds that we get from this litigation must be used for abatement. So it can't be used for our past debts that the city incurred as a result of the opioid crisis. It would only be used going forward. Um, purchases of Narcan, education, um, if we started some type of a treatment program in the city. So these funds are very limited in how we can use it. And you know, while that's disappointing, you know, it is somewhat of an amount of money that is coming to the city. So our outside counsel, as well as the plaintiff's executive committee, is supporting the plan. Um, candidly, if we didn't support it, there's no real consequence. Um, it's, it's not really gonna matter, to be honest with you. Um, and this is just for the bankruptcy of restructuring of Purdue Pharma. So there's other separate litigations that we're engaging in and that they're actively fighting for, but this is really whether or not we're going to, we're in acceptance of their restructuring plan, through the bankruptcy court, and then at that point, if that gets approved, any funds that are allocated um, pursuant to the allocation agreements would be dispersed. Benefit to agreeing to this is is time. So you know they're predicting that the restructuring um, could occur as quickly as the end of the year. You know if we have prolonged litigation, as we see with some of our cases here, it does last forever, and there's no. Um, there's no certainty as to whether or not we'll have an equitable, equitable um, remedy as a result of a trial or things like that. So our outside counsel is recommending um, approval of the plan. I would just ask for a motion to vote if the commission is inclined to do so. Um, the other issue that I was gonna bring up this evening, which I just need consensus for, is in our discussions with our outside counsel, um, the mayor did express some concerns with how the funds were being allocated. So the funds basically go from the state of Florida, to the counties, to the city. And so there's a lot of different levels and layers and formulas that are being um, utilized in order to determine these amounts. Um, they're not really sharing the actual formula, so I was gonna ask for consensus to have our outs to direct our outside counsel to delve a little bit more to find out, for example, why Boca Raton was getting more money than Delray Beach. Hmm. Now, I mean, that doesn't really, it didn't make sense. Um, Mr. Dearman didn't really have an answer, and to his credit, it, it, it's because the formula just, he, nobody can understand how these numbers were derived. And so he, I was going to seek direction to ask him to look into that to find out why we're getting less than our neighboring municipality who 
for all purposes, did not have the, nearly anywhere near no the concerns. crisis that we had. And so um, those are the two things I was requesting this evening. Um, if, you have any, if you need additional information, I'm happy to answer questions. I would definitely support that because when I looked at that, I couldn't even believe it because I know our neighbors to the south really did not have any issues like we did with screaming, you know, sirens going to the next overdose, to the next overdose, the next overdose, and the amount of money that we spent in Narcan and everything else that we did. It was unbelievable. And looking at how inequitable that distribution was, now understanding that we can't even use it for what we've spent the money on already, only moving forward and very restrictive. I don't know. I mean, I still support finding out why that would be. I know that it had to do with something about where distribution of drugs were, but to me, that just encourages bad players, you know, in, in certain areas. It just seems like, oh, we're going to go ahead and benefit you because of the fact that you had the drug, the distribute, distribution centers in your, neighbor, in your areas, but the deaths were actually occurring here. It's very, very frustrating. I do want to know that it's very hard for me to support this moving forward, but I don't think, honestly, that we're going to get any better deal or even a better way of being able to spend it because the state is is basically involved in this in determining how we can spend it. So from my perspective, just in sitting in many of these meetings, I, I don't think we have a wing or a prayer to get anything a, a better deal if we say no to it. So anyway, the number was disappointingly low. It I, was. They, it's just we, it's it's sad. It's sad. I ask one question though: If we collectively deny, do then they go back and look for more funds, or is this simply no, about the structuring? Suit. This is suit. just the restructuring. Okay, yeah. well then, that's, that's what I'm saying. It, and it doesn't have anything to do with the allocation. The allocation is a separate issue. This is just whether or not we want to just almost like cut our losses and okay. just say approve the restructure. Let's talk about allocation. Yep. The only way we're going to get to allocation is what is by approving this plan. Correct. May I may I, may I make a suggestion? So disappointing, but it I is. Understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to suggest that we not waste, waste, spend any more, expend any more energy, time, uh, legal representation trying to fight the state on this. There's so many other fish to fry. That so essentially we're not fighting the state. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's... Who made it's, the allocation? I'm, I'm confused. The allocation's coming from the federal level. So it's more a federal judge appointed a, a, a certain committee that really came up with this allocation method in order to find the best way. I mean, there are so many plaintiffs in this in this litigation that there's no way to that's even properly allocate these funds in a fair and, and equitable manner. And that's why they're saying you can only use it for abatement because they know that if they calculated how much loss even we as a municipality had and you multiplied it by all these municipalities, they're never going to have the funds to cover that. Right. So, and that's, that's especially if it came from the federal level. I. It's, once we filed, everybody piled on, and we were lost in the pile. So I, for one, am not in favor of, of expending your time, our outside attorney's time, fighting a federal bureaucracy that's reinforced by the state that doesn't fight for anybody except the state. Uh, if they could, they probably would have kept all the money. So maybe we just better take what they're going to give us and be happy and go on about our business. Just, just so you know, it, um, the the fees of the outside counsel don't come out of my budget. Mm -hmm. All fees for any counsel that are involved are through the settlement. So it's a separate issue. And but I'm just saying somebody's going to pay them if we do right. any more. Continue. Money is going to be spent somehow, somewhere, to someone. And it's just my contention that sometimes it's better not to fight city hall or s national halls or wherever the halls are. And by the time we finish, we might not even have the 600 and not, how much, how much is it, 600? It's not enough. It's less. No, it's more. I don't even know. I don't have the number in front of me, but it's, it's, it's very low. It's low. It goes out for a term of years. And so it's basically an allocated amount each year. Just be happy that we were thousands. able to cut it's nothing. Ridiculous. Uh, the situation to the point where almost overnight, everybody shut down, everybody closed out. There's a remnant of it still in our city. Perhaps we can spend the few funds that we're going to get to take care of that problem. We're still buying Narcan, so. And the money could be used for that. Yes, so it can, it can be used if for our first responders. There's any way we cannot for, um, spend another penny. Treatment. 
yeah. um, because they do suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder based on what they observed and the money can be used for that. Yes. There can be some positive effects of the money, but unfortunately, I think when we first engaged in this lawsuit, we really thought we were gonna get back the money that the, sure city, the taxpayers had expended to fight this, this war within our city and it's just not the case. And it's we, not we paid someone from Kansas to come and consult, and he did his, his uh, due diligence, and we weren't going to be shut down the way Boca was with their lawsuit against the opioid industry. So, All right, so you need what now? How would you, you like that motion? motion? So it would be a motion to approve uh, the Purdue Pharma um, proposed plan of restructuring in connection with their bankruptcy cases. So moved. Second. Okay, call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. And then there is consensus to look into the there allocations? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Anything else? No, that's it. Thank All you. All right, to the commission. You want to start on this end? Sure, I'll start. Um, thanks. Super quick, Janet Meeks is gone, but I wanted to say thank you. We got a cute packet of thank you cards from the kids who got our summer reading packet, and that was, it was lifting and I'm thrilled that we were a part of that and I appreciate what she did also uh, I was at the launch of the library on the go golf cart which was fabulous very innovative um, so I want to thank the library and its partners none of them are here but hopefully someone's listening uh, and also I just want to acknowledge how much social outreach our library does that I was really unaware of um, and I'll just one example of the um, social outreach and there's a lot of it is the librarian on the loan program which uh, delivers books and materials to elderly individuals suffering from memory loss and the kits are DVDs and flashcards and little booklets that are meant to um, basically uh, work on stimulating memory and recollection because they go back to the 40s, the 50s, 60s. It's really interesting and uh, basically they're going to be working with our seniors at Pompeii Park, so that's pretty exciting. Nice. Our coastal habitat conservation plan is proceeding and we will see that on our upcoming budget. Hold on to your shoes. Mm -hmm. um, the palm trail overlay is also proceeding and we will see that item as well on the budget. Uh, and you know, we've discussed this repeatedly that it can be a template that we can use in other neighborhoods uh, with the goal of planting, protecting and preserving trees. So that's exciting. Um, the beach bucket program is also proceeding. I'm told the Girl Scouts are interested in collaborating with us on this and they may be looking to roll this out nationally. Uh, if that's the case, and I'll just give a quick description of the beach buckets that we're now considering. It's a pole that would almost look like a coat rack with hooks, and then it will have canvas bags on it. Um, and basically, if this works out as we anticipate, the Girl Scouts will be constructing the poles with the guidance of the Public Works Department, and the city will maintain the poles. Uh, and the Sandaway will create an outreach program to explain the installations and the impacts of plastics and the importance of conservation. So thank you to the Girl Scouts for your interest in our city and hopefully we'll be working together soon. Um, also, a few months ago I spoke about a hunger initiative. Um, I was working um, something geared towards making sure school children are not food insecure. And you may recall that the county received a generous donation. I was very excited about that. However, it's come to my attention that somehow this donation falls short of addressing the needs of these uh, very needy students on the weekends. So I'm working with a group of people on assessing the situation, I'm just letting you know. And lastly, I want to talk about Pompeii Park very quickly. I spoke to Sam. Um, you you know, a lot of us have heard that the pool's closed on Sundays. Apparently that's not the typical schedule. That is because work is being done. Um, and as soon as the work is done, which is expected to be completed very soon, the pools will be open again on Sundays. So that's great. Um, also, this is very exciting, Ms. Johnson, you'll be thrilled, as am I, that Sam indicated that um, the pool will now, in the future, I guess it's under consideration, be free to kids 10 and under. Ooh, yes. So nice. in the past, one of the concerns that I've had, and you share that concern as well, was that the cost was pretty prohibitive to a family who has maybe four children. 
So this is very exciting news. I want to say thank, thank you to the city. Thank you, Sam, if you're listening. And lastly, I would like to let you know that I am beyond excited because it seems that we can have two more lanes mm. at the pool to accommodate our swim team. And I believe that item will be coming in front of us in the near future. And I look forward to that boat. Very That's good. all I have for this evening. Thank right, you. Thank you very much. Good. My um, pleasure. Deputy Vice Mayor, anything? The only thing I wanted to bring up was um, uh, congratulations and thanks to Sam, mm -hmm. everyone at Parks and Rec. I was incognito at the beach Sunday and watching the Sandcastle competition and they had some volunteers and a really nice turnout and some really nice stuff. So uh, big kudos to those guys. Very good, thank you. Wait, may I add to that? The DDA was also there. Mavis right. was there. I and didn't see you, Laura. Duncan was there. <laughs> I, saw you. Yeah. I, saw I did see Duncan. It was fabulous, and it was very hot. They were committed, yes, for sure. very good. Okay. Vice Mayor? Yes, thank, thank you. Um, I'm not going to be long. I only have uh -huh. one. I, hmm. <laughs> I won't be long, if I'm not interrupted. I first would like to uh, welcome Alice back. It's been a long time. Welcome back. We miss you. Um, friendly face, you survived COVID. Mm -hmm. So uh, my own one and only item, I had several. I'm, no. Did you welcome those? No, that was not an item. That was a welcome. You interrupted. That's another five minutes. Uh, and she means it. Yes, I do. <laughs> we, um, we had a presentation tonight on the Old School Square City property. Uh, there is more to the story than meets the eye. I would hope that, uh, I would request rather that the city attorney, uh, if she hasn't already done so, to brief you on this nonprofit. There is a lot going on, and I would hope that since we haven't had very much um, management on that situation, that uh, maybe we want to make sure that we regain control of it, and I'd like to like consent to have this item placed on the agenda to discuss next at the next city commission meeting. May I ask you a question? And I have a question too. Oh, because we our um, arrangement with them relates to their renting of the property, which I believe is for a dollar. <coughs> that aside, and I've asked for that contract, but we somebody sent me something. It was an older contract, I believe. I, at any I rate, I think there's a lot going on. Well, but should we be discussing this at the CRA? Well, that's what I was going to ask. Is it appropriate? And where is the a guide? Uh, we're going to be, I guess, going down that process. Our, I think we meeting. should discuss the city's control of the situation. Okay. And then when we, if we do that on the 13th, 13th mm -hmm. next city commission meeting, when we have our CRA meeting, on the 15th. What is it? 15th. Okay. 15th. We might have a better understanding as to where we stand. Right. So you want to view it from the point of where the, the landlord city is standing, controls the property. The, the CRA. Oh, I'm totally amenable to that. Versus the funds. Did you want to say something, Lynn, before? It's, uh, there's already an agenda item on the Old School Square say. property for next week. Um, it, it relates to the renovations that are currently in process on the property, and they need to obtain the consent of the commission. So that item, it's... Is that a discussion item? It is. And do we, are we able to discuss what uh, the vice mayor is talking about during that time? There's more than just that. Oh, I understand. I mean, it's, it's, it's an agenda item, so whatever you feel you is appropriate in consideration... just didn't want it restricted to just that item. No, we wouldn't. No, you, you, no there's no restrictions. It's... it's there's no notice requirement. You right. know, only notice would restrict whatever your conversations are. So you're you're more than welcome to discuss anything related to that. I think we've got it already covered. Very we'll good. have it all. And, Very I, good. And, I, and I would I would suggest between now and then that we all take the time to understand the difference between the CRA is the A guide. Mm -hmm. right? It's funding and actually could fund that organization without it being in that building. Although I don't know why you would. I beg um, your pardon. But I don't want to confuse. The, I'm, I'm well, confused what I'm about saying, what you said, Commissioner. My point. My point is. There's Old School Square, the buildings, and then there's a nonprofit, Old School Square, right. that operates it right now. The city decides that relationship. The CRA decides that funding. And so my suggestion would be that we all understand that dynamic before discussing next Tuesday. Cool? I think we already do. 
Could you make be clear as to what we need to understand about that? I mean, just, just that there's an organization there. Yes, now. there's a there's a board and, and there's there are, an organization that's right. a nonprofit, and then there's also and, the buildings. And there's the buildings. Right. And then the and then the CRA right. determines the A guide. Doesn't funding. determine who runs those buildings. Yeah. Just funds it. They're just funding it. They don't actually make the choice on what organization is in those buildings. That's Nobody the said they that's did. The, I know, I know. No, I that's just what he's sure. saying. He's wanting to make sure that everybody understands that. I get that we it. All, that we all have that going into next Tuesday. Correct. Right. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Pretty good. Is there anything else? No, thank you. All right. That was <laughs> it, Commission. Um, uh, Deputy Vice Mayor, that was it. So Commissioner, just segues, Commissioner Boylston. Yeah, that just segues into my thank you to, to staff. The most efficient meeting I have every single week is the pre-commission meeting on Fridays. And it's instead of it just being with the city manager or just being with the city attorney, we share agendas beforehand and the, all the right team members or department heads are in the meeting jumping in and out on, according to our agenda for that week. Um, you get and, the and it properly prepares me for these meetings and all my questions have been answered and I really, really appreciate, appreciate that. And I'm hoping to continue that as our new City manager transitions in. May I ask a question? You get you get an update with the entire staff. Depending on our agenda and what staff members need to be there for the agenda that we have decided that we have decided on for that week, it's extremely beneficial. And I would suggest if anyone's not doing it, to carve out the time to do so. Okay. So um, thank you. And I have to run because I left the funeral to get here. Oh my. Oh, I'm sorry. Goodbye. The only um, the only thing I because everybody else hit everything that I was going to talk about or or uh, was going to speak about the only thing that I was going to ask about is um, it was a question uh, of remote uh, advisory board attendance and I think that I already spoke with um, the city uh, attorney about this and and that it is acceptable and I just wanted to make sure that uh, that was just kind of written on the record or told, said on the record I did have interest in talking about the tree protection I think you've already hit that and um, also one other thing too uh, you know there's there's a lot of things that are kind of overlapping uh, with respect to SPRAB and, and to PNZ I want us to maybe think about combining those two I think it might actually make something easier and maybe having an architectural review board and the reason for that is because SPRAB and and uh, PNZ a lot of the things go hand in hand and when SPRAB or when PNC is meeting they're not allowed to talk about the SPRAB issues and vice versa, and yet, you know, they, they may not decide to go in a direction if it weren't for the, um, you know, if they, if they were allowed to consider other things. So I kind of almost feel like it's a, it's a very bifurcated, uh, you know, uh, a couple of um, boards that I actually think would work better if it was together. That's my opinion. It's something I'd love to discuss Maybe at, uh, it doesn't have to be right away. There's no, you know, there's nothing on a timeline or anything. It's just something I'm thinking about. And then having a separate, you know, architectural review kind of type board, if there, if that was it, more like uh, that, w that isn't so technical in in um, in what they're trying to do. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to say, uh, kudos to the city for um, the foresight of the Fourth of July. I know that we have received a lot of. Um, negative press, negative uh, people saying things because they couldn't see their, the fireworks from outside their yard. Um, but I also received a lot of very positives that pers people that used to have to, well, had to drive every year to get to see them um, being able to stand in their backyard and, and, and watch the fireworks. I think it was the prudent thing to do. I think that, you know, when we're talking about other municipalities around us had had, had no no interest and in, in not funded, they had not funded any uh, fireworks that would have absolutely put an incredible even a larger burden on our city for the type of um, event that we normally put put off and I think that we would have really been inundated this year more so than even in e previous years where we have the the um, you know other our, our neighboring towns actually shooting off fireworks as well um, with that in the press when we had to make that decision and I've I've responded to as many emails as, as I can in explaining that we had to make this decision when we still didn't know if we were going to have the access to vaccinations for everybody, as we do. We just couldn't make that prediction back when we were making this decision. And that's when we were deciding on funding and, uh, you know, we had to get uh, events lined up and, 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 and activities and, um, you know, entertainment and everything else that goes into this huge undertaking for Fourth of July. So 
our apologies for those that we let down. Hopefully next year we'll come back, you know, um, Delray strong and do it even twice as good as we've done in the past. But it wasn't um, it wasn't a um, something that I think was uh, done uh, in an intentional way to make it so that certain people weren't having fun. It was absolutely based in all of the right for all the right reasons. And so I'm proud that this commission stood up and did what was right at the time. It was, and it still, I think, was the right thing to do, the way to go. And I'm very proud of how our um, Parks and Recreation uh, Department handled it. And I also wanna say one more thing about this commission. I'm super proud. When I got the call from, um, from Sam on Saturday or Sunday, whenever it was that he finally admitted where they were going to have them, he said to me, and I didn't wanna know, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I don't want that responsibility of having to lie to everybody. But he said to me, not one of you guys on that commission called me and asked me, not one. And I thought that was really, really great because, you know, um, nobody was trying to get, you know, their friends out there, or, you know, doing, we, we did the right thing. So, you know, kudos to everybody on this commission and also for um, a great fireworks display for those that were able to see it or uh, did get a chance to take a peek. It was absolutely beautiful and stunning. I saw it at a very big distance through a little tiny opening in trees, but I didn't care. I understood it. I was good. So thank you all, and uh, you know we'll see you in a week. Take care.